You're now live. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Blue Ribbon Commission on the Future of the California Bar Exam. Um, let's go ahead, uh, Devin, and take roll. Okay. Uh, Joshua Pertula? Here. Susan Bokshian? Here. David Boyd? Here. Um, Alex Chan? Present. Charles Dugan? Here. Jeremy Evans? Here. Jackie Gardina? Here. Ryan Harrison? Dr. Henderson? Here. Esther Lynn? Here. Uh, Tracy Montez? Here. Judge Reeser? Natalie Rodriguez? Here. Uh, Kristen Rossi? Emily Scavaletto? Here. Karen Silverman? Here. Mylon Spencer? Here. Um, and Amy Williams? Present. We have quorum, Chair. Great. Thank you. Um, let me begin uh, briefly with some chair's remarks, uh, and then we'll um, we'll move to public comment, and then uh, and then to business. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone. At the last meeting, we had uh, a, a really uh, great and important discussion. I think we were able to narrow some of our uh, preferences uh, and group preferences down, um, such that we. Um, uh, have a number of elements to discuss today to try to get towards a recommendation, um, and we're getting much closer to doing that. Um, for today, we are going to first hear from uh, the Law Society of Ontario. Uh, we've had a chance to review the report before the last meeting. Um, we'll have a presenter. After that, we're going to get back into our discussion on the uh, three models and, and some of the elements uh, that we selected at the last meeting. Um, as for timeline, I thought it was important that we share with everyone. I think there is, um, we received some um, written public comment, um, had a chance to review it. It's been distributed to all of the members. It's just really important for folks to understand that there's going to be plenty of time for uh, public input. So we put together a quick um, uh, uh, timeline that we're going to try to hold to so that everybody understands kind of um, what our goals are here. We're hopeful that today we can come to some resolution on recommendations. Those would then be um, written up uh, by bar staff. And as you can see by this timeline, they would be put out for a 90 day public comment period. We would then um, receive those public comments. We would reconvene uh, as a commission. We would discuss those comments and modify uh, as necessary. And then we would submit the report to the uh, board of trustees um, our goal would be to get it to the Board of Trustees in the first quarter of 2023, um, and then the board would um, decide whether or not to take action and, and um, send it on to uh, the Supreme Court. So uh, that is our goal as far as timeline um, and, and public comment period. Um, with that, I'd like to turn to uh, public comment from folks in the audience today. Um, we're going to do up to 30 minutes if necessary, shorter if there are not that many speakers, two minutes per person. Uh, if you are uh, in the audience would like to comment, please raise your hand uh, via Zoom and you will be called on. Um, and uh, I thank you for uh, 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 participating. Devin, with that, are you gonna do public comment today? I am. Okay, fantastic. So for our first uh, public comment, we have Tyler. Taylor, you have the mic. Good morning. Can you all hear me? We can. Yes. Wonderful. My name is Tyler Sutherland, and I'm the Director of Racial Justice and Equity at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, which we call LAFLA. LAFLA is one of the 11 civil legal service organizations within California with funding from the Legal Services Corporation. In 2021, LAFLA served more than 100,000 low-income residents of Los Angeles County. Today, I'm here to express my support for the non-exam pathway to licensure via supervised practice, and will briefly explain how this pathway supports racial equity for our profession and within the communities within legal aid that legal aid serves. 
It takes a very special person to commit to a career in legal aid where starting salaries are less than half of what is common in the private sector. Unlike big law firms, legal aid organizations do not have the luxury of making offers to law students after their 2L summer. The months between when someone graduates from law school and when someone becomes licensed are incredibly detrimental to the hiring and retention of diverse CAB candidates at LAFLA. Law student graduates of color are less likely to have the economic supports to keep them afloat while they volunteer at nonprofit agencies while awaiting bar results. This gap in time means we lose excellent diverse candidates who otherwise might have the heart and aptitude required for legal aid work. Allowing for a supervised practice pathway to licensure will allow legal aid organizations to hire law school graduates earlier and will prevent the loss of some qualified candidates. Additionally, this pathway will mitigate the intense racial disparity that we see in bar exam results, which will hopefully increase the diversity of our profession so that more of LAFLA's diverse client population will be served from attorneys that come from their same communities. Thank you for your time. Our next public uh, comment is Claire. Good morning. This is Claire Solot from the Legal Service Funders Network. I am sorry I was unable to join you for last month's meeting. Um, I know there's going to be excellent public comment, as we've just heard, about issues such as racial equity and other challenges associated with a traditional written bar exam. I'm going to speak about a couple different things. First of all, I'm excited to share with you that later this month, we'll be doing our midterm evaluation for this year's cohort of LSN fellows, and included in that will be newly designed forms that will be very similar to what has been discussed in terms of assessments of portfolio projects. And so in September, uh, we will be able to share with you some of those results. I think this will help ease a lot of the concern about how one administers an evaluation process for supervised visit, uh, practice. The other most exciting news I have to share with you has to do with money, which we know is always a concern. Included in the public comment that was shared today was a letter from one of the country's leading foster care funders discussing why they support the LSFN Fellowship and their continued interest in supporting projects and programs that will help increase access to justice, diversity in the profession, and inclusion of non-traditional attorneys in the practice. We all know that no matter what revisions are done to a written bar exam, they will never be able to mitigate issues such as imposter syndrome, PTSD, and economic disparities between examinees. Therefore, it's critical if this organization is true to its mission to increase access to justice and diversity in the profession, to add in pathways to licensure that are not solely based on a written exam. Many other municipalities and states and countries have recognized this. It's time that California does so as well. Thank you. Thank you. And our next comment is from Sebastian. Good morning to all members of the commission. My name is Sebastian Bendek, and I'm currently apprenticing as a provisionally licensed lawyer at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. I've completed over 3,200 hours of legal work in the areas of eviction defense, domestic violence, and deportation defense. I believe that an alternative pathway to licensure would be of benefit to the State Bar of California and the California Provisionally Licensed Lawyers collectively. After nearly two years of legal practice as an apprentice, I believe it is safe to say that we have all been vetted, challenged, and humbled in our legal positions. After the exit and impact of the global pandemic, we were left with many revelations and epiphanies about practitioners of the law, the violations of law committed by practitioners of the law, and that there is no perfect way to admit members into the practice of law. In the 19th century, most American attorneys were admitted via apprenticeship. In the 20th century, most American attorneys were admitted via bar examination. In the post-pandemic era, a middle ground is being found 
that validates both methods of admission to the degree of minimum competence. I believe that an alternative pathway to licensure should be created and that the remaining California provisionally licensed lawyers should be admitted on motion based on hours served in the program. Considering the circumstances over the past two years and the achievements that this select group has managed to produce, I believe that minimum competence can be displayed to the bar on a case-by-case -case determination. Thank you for your time. I waive the rest of mine. Our next public comment is from Erica. Good morning. My name is Eric Abramian, and I'm a provisionally licensed California lawyer. I acquired my license in the fall of 2021 and have since been practicing with my supervising attorney in the field of corporate transactional law and civil litigation. While law school provided me the basic tools to understand the law, practicing with a provisional license has provided context that has been invaluable in representing clients with confidence, knowing how to work with other attorneys and negotiating. I entered law school in the fall of 2017 for the purpose of helping artists, writers, apparel and retail companies structure deals and ensuring their rights as creatives were protected. Ironically, while at a top 100 law school, I was not able to take many of the courses that made me interested in the law in the first place because I had to take the course because I had to take over a dozen required bar courses to pass the bar exam. It was not until I began practicing with a provisional license that I learned by experience all the tasks performed in the area of law I wanted to practice. Of course, I failed the bar exam four times. I didn't go to law school to practice criminal law, criminal procedure, trusts and wills, or constitutional law. While in law school, I accepted the fact that I had to get through these classes to get my license, but little did I know that three years after I graduated, my less than minimum competence in areas of law that I will never practice would prevent me from beginning my career and paying off a quarter million dollars of debt. An alternative pathway to becoming a licensed attorney is the only sustainable way to move forward. Graduates of law schools should be able to select specific career paths without having subjects they will never practice stand in the way of their licensure. The current method is antiquated, mentally, physically, and financially straining, and not in the best interest of the public. Thank you for your time. Um, our next public comment is from Guy. Hello, my name is Guy Thomas Bonatati. My, I'm a provisionally licensed lawyer, started in September of 2021. My area of practice is immigration law removal defense for clients aspiring to become United States citizen. In 2015, after receiving a bachelor degree at a Cal State University, I started in the legal field as a volunteer at Legal Aid Services of Los Angeles. To date, I have over 1,300 hours as a provisionally licensed lawyer. Within that time, I have drafted a number of motions and federal appeals. I have appeared on my own and represented clients at over 105 EOIR pretrial hearings. I spent one and a half years at an ABA school, did not meet their protocol for continuing and told I would never pass the bar exam. I transferred to a California bar school and where my law school experience was more than I could have hoped for. I studied international human rights at The Hague and also in Strasbourg, France. I think the most important part is for sure, I'm a brown Italian, but more importantly, what can we as PLL provide to our clients and our attorney owner? The attorney owner is bearing the cost of training us. The bar exam is biased. It appears it does not test for compassion or diligence. And as far as the law school being a marathon, the real test of endurance began when I began to practice law. My attorney owner loves this program. As she says, there are a lot of intelligent bar exam passers that are not, not equipped for the, lie, the work I am doing. But this program gives her the opportunity to give practical training to a law school graduate. It is apprenticeship in the true sense of the word. I have been blessed to be at a place that cares about their associates' mental well-being and gives hands-on practical training because representing the law firm name is critical to its success. The non-exam pathway to licensure should be a totality of the circumstances based on factors 
that the Blue River Commission comes up with. Thank you. We have no additional public comment at this time. Okay. okay. Um, Devin, I do see a couple of hands that popped up in the end. Can we take the last two here? Sure. Um, Thank you. Patrick? Yes, good morning. My name is Patrick Quinn. I'm a provisionally licensed lawyer and I was provisionally licensed beginning in December of 2020. I would like to thank the commission for their time and their efforts and everything they've done. I would like to also make light uh, known a couple of things. First, I became a provisionally licensed lawyer during the darkest times of my life. It was during a global pandemic and it was also after developing adult epilepsy. I had two grand mal seizures, kidney failure, and a, and a slew of neurological issues. However, this provisional licensed lawyer has, a, this program has allowed me to gain real life experience. I've put in over 3000 hours. I have almost 500 appearances on the record. I've done motions for felony matters, which have been very successful. The reason I say this is for this one fact only. Provisionally licensed lawyers are not scared of taking the bar exam. It is, it is, there's a misconception of that. I have taken the bar exam every single time that I've been physically able to. Unfortunately, I have not passed. However, I've still had success with the provisionally licensed program. I believe myself, my supervising attorney, many judges, and many other colleagues in the area of criminal defense would, uh, would also stand by and support that I am minimally competent. Um, so I just wanted to make light of this to the commission because I think there is a, sometimes a misconception and criticism that provisionally licensed lawyers are just trying to skip the bar. And for my case, I physically couldn't take the bar. I was fighting for my life. And with this, I waive the rest of my time and wish everybody a blessed week. Our next public comment is from Jessica. Good morning, my name is Jessica Juarez. I work as a provisional licensed uh, lawyer full-time for a nonprofit organization in San Francisco. Our organization mostly represents seniors and those with disabilities. I have completed over 2,100 hours in just eviction defense work thus far. I also work as a legal services funders network senior mentor. More than 25% of our fellows and mentors who took the July 2022 exam reported back problems with how the exam was not being administered uniformly. The re range of issues shared uh, are late start times, both at the start of the day and after breaks, proctors being misinformed regarding rules, such as the use of scratch paper and highlighters, proctors inconsistently enforcing rules, one person saying that they were told not to use scratch paper, but another person who was sitting in the same section was allowed to use a scratch paper by the same proctor, proctors talking and laughing uh, to each other socially during the exam, proctors not knowing how to administer the exam, for example, handing out materials early um, and not giving correct pack-up instructions, uh, power shutting off in rooms and examinees being told that they would have to hand write essays, uh, being unable to hear or understand the instructions being given by the proctors. While a revised exam may help address bias in the exam, it will not solve the inconsistency issues regarding exam venues and proctors. And waiting for the revised exam in a few years causes us to wait a very long time and puts our lives in limbo. I and others who are part of the 2020 uh, PLL program have up to two years of supervised work and an apprenticeship experience. And we are ready, willing, and able to be part of a pathway pilot to show you that it can work. I waive the rest of my time. Thank you. Okay, that concludes uh, public comment. Uh, I do wanna say I appreciate it, all of the comments. Um, we truly believe in the process and it's helpful at times to have some perspective and individual stories. So thank you everyone for your time um, and commitment. Um, I think uh, moving to business, I believe we need um, a motion to approve minutes from the last meeting. Someone willing to make that motion? I move to approve, Josh. I'll second. Jeremy with the motion, Jackie with the second. Devin, can you take roll? Uh, Joshua Petrullo. Here. Yes. Uh, Susan Bakshian. Yes. David Boyd. Yes. Alex Chan. Present. Oh, yes. Charles Dugan. Yes. 
Jeremy Evans. Yes. Jackie Gardina. Yes. Ryan Harrison. Dr. Henderson. Abstain. I was not present at the last meeting. Esther Lynn. Abstain for the same reason. Uh, Tracy Montez. Approved. Natalie Rodriguez. I also abstain. I was absent. Uh, Emily Savaletto. Yes. Karen Silverman. Yes. Mylon Spencer. Yes. And Amy Williams. In favor. The motion passes. Thank you. Um, I think that takes us to the business part of our agenda. Um, and I don't know if um, Priya is available now. We can invite her. Yes, we will promote her now. Great. Perfect. Um, folks, we have with us um, Priya Bhatia, uh, who is the Executive Director, Professional Development and Competence at the Law Society of Ontario. Uh, as a presenter, we left, we'll have plenty of time for questions. And with that, Priya, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to address you all today. Uh, we are very interested in the work that you are doing in California and are pleased to have the opportunity to share our experiences. So uh, in particular, Audrey uh, Ching, please uh, wanted to thank you for reaching out and uh, for um, allowing me this time to, to share our, our experiences with you. Um, I am going to go to the next slide, please. So um, I wanted to just do a bit of context and background for those of you who may or may not be familiar with uh, what we do in Ontario. I know that you have read one of our reports and uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you had the opportunity to look at that. It gives you quite a bit of background, but just to touch on a few of the key elements. So, you know, similar to other jurisdictions in North America, experiential training has been a part of the lawyer training landscape for many decades. In fact, it predates law school in its current form. However, unlike the US and Canada, experiential training in the form of articling has remained a critical component and a requirement for licensure in Ontario. So all my comments are gonna come from that place of uh, you know, how we have experienced experiential training, which, you know, we kind of use both terms, articling or experiential training. Um, of course, as a licensure requirement uh, here in Canada, which, you know, may be quite different from what uh, is being contemplated as a supervised uh, practice pathway or may have some similarities with what you're thinking about in California. So I really just want to share our insights from that perspective. Um, so it predates law school. Uh, it is still viewed by many as integral to lawyer training and development, supporting the transition from law student to entry level competent practitioner. Law schools in Canada are excellent. Uh, they are, however, still by and large oriented towards more theoretical training uh, with a few exceptions that I'll mention in a moment. Um, as opposed to the practical clinical training focused on client service and communication, practice management and file management that we as regulators are keenly interested in seeing uh, um, taking place at, at a formative stage uh, of a law students uh, learning. So just by way of context in Ontario, candidates seeking licensure must fulfill three core requirements to be licensed. One is completing a period of experiential training. Um, the other, and there are three pathways, which I'll talk about in a moment. The other two are the barrister and solicitor examinations, and then the good character requirement. So coming back to experiential training, there are three distinct pathways in Ontario, uh, all anchored to our experiential training competencies. And I have included a link there to those competencies, which are on our website. First one being articling, which is you know, the, the traditional program that the majority of our candidates are, uh, are pursuing. 
say 90% and above, so about 2,200 placements a year. It involves working under a lawyer in good standing with at least five years of call to the bar for a minimum of eight months. The second pathway is the Law Practice Program, which is an alternative pathway introduced by the Law Society in 2014 in response like primarily to the shortage of placements, articling placements, but also in response to some of the other challenges of articling that I'll talk to you about. This is an eight month program consisting of a four month training course that simulates the practice of law using a virtual law firm concept, followed by a four month work placement. So there is a practical period uh, in that, um, but it's shorter and it follows as a very intense training course portion. So candidates are really hitting the ground running once they get into their placement. We have two uh, providers for that. We have Toronto Metropolitan University offering the English program and the University of Ottawa offering the French program. This pathway is um, a smaller pathway. We're seeing about 250 to through 275 candidates pursuing this pathway every year. And it's about, an, the program is about eight years running now. Um, the third pathway is the integrated practice curriculum, which I understand resembles one of the other pathways you're also exploring, which is a, a, pro, a, a law school based program uh, currently offered at two out of eight Ontario law schools, Lakehead University and Toronto Metropolitan University. These are the newest law programs in the country, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, so establishing uh, a program like the integrated practice curriculum is obviously uh, a big change in direction and, it, and it, we do see the um, long-standing law schools struggling with that a little bit and maybe not as in interested in doing that at this time although uh, you know there are certainly conversations being had what the program is is it involves a co-teaching model where full-time faculty partner with practitioner instructors to support experiential training competencies instruction through practical assignments and tasks beginning right in first year running all the way to third year with a four month placement in the third year of law school. Candidates graduating from these IPC programs as we call them do not have to complete a period of experiential training after law school. So whereas the law practice program and articling take place after law school the IPC or integrated practice curriculum is the only pre um, call, what I should, I should say, it's the only program that actually is taking place during law school. Currently, they are there, these are the only programs uh, like this in Canada, but other provinces, namely Alberta and British Columbia, who I think you may have heard from last year, are exploring similar concepts. And this was approved by the Law Society in 2013 as a concept. Other law schools are certainly um, able to apply and seek that accreditation from us. However, I think the, the issue is the one I sort of referenced, which is um, the uh, realities of changing a law school, established law school program so dramatically. There are about 60 candidates graduating from the Lakehead program every year and the, and the T Toronto Metropolitan University program, which is still relatively new, they're going into their third year, so they haven't graduated a class yet, but there are about 150 of them. Both the law practice program and the integrated practice curriculum providers are required to report to the Law Society because these programs are naturally in some way governed by us. The law practice program is really a provider of service as we are retaining them to do the program for us. The integrated practice curriculum is a little different. We are governing the experiential training component of their law school program and so they would be reporting to us on those components on an annual basis and seeking our approval of major changes to those programs. These are both outsourced models in a sense and they work very well so far um, where you have you know uh, law schools which are in a better position to do that kind of training than, than anything else perhaps uh, integrating or supporting experiential training competencies. All of this has been the subject of a lot of stakeholder consultation and policy reform for at least the past two decades. And so I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about that. But that's sort of the current uh, model that we are following. So 
Uh, next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about articling and what are some of the challenges. I mean, I, I think that in Ontario, the, pro, the challenges of articling have dominated our policy reform and stakeholder consultation activities over the last few years, for sure. Um, and I'll just highlight some of the themes. Um, one is a shortage of placements. Currently, only 640 of the nearly 12,000 law firms in Ontario offering, are, are offering articling placements. And of course, this is where you see, uh, you know, the uptake may reflect that training takes work. Training uh, is, some, is an add-on activity. It is very fulfilling. And of course, articling students can add value um, to the, the law practice, but there is an investment. Um, of time and uh, effort that some practitioners are, are unable to uh, contribute. We are seeing year over year increases in the number of applicants in Ontario. So compare 2016, where we had 2,300 applicants versus 2021, where we had 2,800 applicants of increase of over 20%. And we have not seen a corresponding increase in the number of article placements over the same time period. Hence, our decision to implement a law practice program in 2014, which is meant to address some of that. And of course, the IPC programs are even, uh, you know, in an even better position to support uh, increasing numbers because all of that training is happening in the law school period and not placing a demand on the market afterwards. Um, much of the increase in the number of applicants can be attributed to increase the number of internationally trained applicants seeking licensure in Ontario. We're seeing a 40% of our 2021 applicants were internationally trained and trained outside of Canada. Another challenge uh, with articling is inconsistent training. We do observe varying quality of training and coverage of the experiential training competencies in articling. This isn't surprising. I mean, this is a distributed model where training is outsourced to busy practitioners and not all of them are gonna approach their, uh, the, the training in the same way. However, as a public interest regulator, we have an obligation to facilitate meaningful and effective training. And I'll be telling you in a few moments about what we're going to do to, to ensure that is happening. Um, but that is a challenge. And I think that's a challenge with any model where you have clinicians uh, or practitioners assisting with training of individuals. Mounting debt loads and financial pressures are certainly a theme. I heard uh, those themes in some of the public commentary as well. Um, students are graduating from law school with six-figure uh, loans. Uh, this is creating pressure on them to become licensed and find remunerative work, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, in some cases, exacerbating inherent power imbalances in the early years of practice. And so as a regulator that has a, you know, a work placement as a prerequisite to licensure, um, we have to always be mindful of the fact that we're putting that requirement into place, while it has value, it does, it can be a barrier if candidates aren't able to access those positions. On the other side, of course, it can be a, a, um, a, road, a roadway to employment. Uh, so um, there's, there's definitely that side to it as well. Recently, um, you know, in the past, I'd say that, you know, there were a lot of themes around consistency of articling and insufficient numbers of articling. In recent years, I would say, we're starting to see more um, feedback about some of the exploitative, potential for exploitative working conditions in some articling positions. By and large, most do not, uh, are, are not represented here, but there are these inherent power imbalances and there are opportunities for exploitative working conditions. I suppose there are in any position, but in a position where a candidate may have debt load needs the position to get through, to get to licensure, uh, we may be seeing, we do see a certain percentage of candidates who are articling for free. And it's only, well, I mean, again, I'm telling my story in a, in a way that I, it'll unfold, but there are things that the law study is doing that will address this. But to date, the, the thought of candidates graduating from law school and then going and doing eight months, 10 months of articles for free um, has not sat well with the profession, does not sit well with the regulator, and does fly in the face of, um, you know, what we would say fairness and just minimum standards. 
And finally, unfortunately, uh, we do see incidences of harassment and discrimination uh, occurring in the legal profession as we do see in, 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 any, in other workplaces and in society. Um, those with less power and privilege are more likely to experience it and then we could say that our students fall into that group. Uh, when you know the law society is seeing this reported in an ARCAN context, we certainly uh, have taken notice and have um, and wanted to address it. So next slide, please. Um, just to touch on one of the areas of interest, I understand you had uh, read about our articling survey. I just wanted to give you a bit of background on that. So this is one of the instruments we've used to gather more information about the articling program. Um, in the spring of 2017, the Law Society commissioned an articling survey to gather data about the effectiveness of articling. Because what you know, what some of the themes and challenges I've been just telling you about, we've really heard about anecdotally. Um, we haven't necessarily had all of those issues reported to us through formal channels, uh, but we certainly knew that we have known for some time that some of these issues are, are occurring. So the survey uh, focused on broad topics related to quality of training and supervision, readiness to practice, job satisfaction, as well as mistreatment. And you can see we had a fairly large sample size um, and it included candidates who were articling and those who've been called to the bar for a few years. The key outcomes that I'm, I'm sharing here, and these are by far not all the outcomes, um, but the ones that have sort of driven a number of the policy initiatives in recent years, uh, were related to discriminatory conduct or comments. You'll see that 19% 90, of the respondents reported that. Another 17% uh, reported differential treatment based on an enumerated ground under the code. Um, and then about 10% reported remuneration of less than $20,000 a year, which would be less than the minimum wage. We continue to um, survey on these issues and we have seen uh, trends continuing, perhaps to a lesser extent, on the discriminatory conduct uh, and comments and mistreatment, but still enough to, to be concerned. I would say we're probably in the 12 to 14% range and a little higher on the reports of remuneration being less than minimum wage. Next slide, please. So all of that to say, we take all of that and, and that's, you know, all of the information and, and sort of insight that has been driving the policy work. And I'm just gonna um, give you a little bit of context for the report that you've, I think, reviewed, which was the May 2018 report, um, just to say that there was work leading up to that, that included the articling survey. We came up with that consultation report that outlined four options um, for changes to the licensing process. And in fact, in that bucket of changes were changes to the licensing examinations as well. Um, where we ended up as of December 2018, uh, the Law Society Convocation, which is a basically a way of describing formal meetings of our entire board of governors, adopts option two, which was is option two in the in the May 2018 report, which was the status quo with enhancement. So experiential training pathways, all of them are maintained. The main changes are introducing a man mandatory minimum compensation for placement. So addressing that exploitative uh, working conditions issue, um, mandatory training for principals and supervisors to address the harassment and discrimination issues, the issues around mistreatment and quality of training, frankly, and then some enhanced oversight and monitoring through audits and other means, uh, which all of which was to go live on May 1st, 2023. Next slide, please. And then of course we had the pandemic. And unfortunately that meant that we had to put on hold our implementation of these enhancements. Um, and um, what that meant was we, uh, sorry, I should have said the implementation date originally was May 1st, 2021. That makes more sense. Um, but now we were not able to, uh, not able to, to meet that. We instead shifted our focus quite dramatically as many regulators did to ensuring the continuity of our licensing process. So um, that meant transitioning our in-person examination delivery to online delivery. Uh, we reduced our period of experiential training from 10 months to eight months, just because we had seen the lockdowns, the remote work impacting articling principles ability to offer these placements. We didn't wanna lose all the placements 
and administering and admi implementing an administrative call to the bar procedure. In Ontario, we have a ceremonial call to the bar, but we needed a, a way to call people to the bar uh, without large gatherings. And finally, we, we did some work on providing some competence supports to address gaps that were created by these altered training and working arrangements that were necessitated by the pandemic. And um, this was where we took our existing co content actually from our CPD library and created a new bridge to practice program, which was really offered for free to new, uh, to articling students and to new licensees and, uh, and was well received. Next slide, please. So coming back to the enhancements, we, our board actually didn't really have a chance to turn its mind to that until the fall of 2021 and the spring. And despite, you know, we had a, I guess a, a few challenges in that in the intervening pandemic, uh, we had, so we had economic impacts. We also had a significant turnover in our governance board in the spring of 2019. So we had new eyes on enhancements that had been approved by a previous board. Here's where we ended up. Uh, we ended up with largely the same package of enhancements, uh, although a bit of a close vote, mandatory minimum compensation did get passed. Um, but the big change is that the orientation or training program is now optional rather than mandatory. And it also includes candidates as opposed to just principals and supervisors. We will be taking a risk-based approach to monitoring placements, meaning, you know, realistically to, uh, to address uh, marginal placements, we'll be looking at those placements that tend to end early, because that tends to be a sign that a uh, placement is in trouble, that there's something going on, uh, which is, allows us to do our work well, as opposed to sort of a scattergun approach where we, you know, we're, we're trying to monitor a bunch of placements where we have 2,200 placements, you can imagine that task. And, and another aspect of the enhancements this time around was to continue to develop the Bridge to Practice program, which we can leverage. Um, another development of interest is emerged from another committee, uh, our Competence Task Force in May of this year approved a practice essentials course, um, which is mandatory for anyone who is going to practice as a sole practitioner, whether they've been called to the bar for 20 years or just licensed recently. And this will be implemented in uh, early 2024. And what's interesting with that is it's taking some of the um, you know, competency requirements and some of the, uh, the learning requirements that we would normally sort of shove into licensing and saying, well, let's put them in the post-call period and let's do it in a risk-based fashion. Let's target them to those who we know need that because if you're working in a supervised environment or an environment where you have access to other practitioners and, and, and mentors, you're likely going to get that kind of support that you need but it's when you're working alone that we see that you're, you're the greatest regulatory risk. Next slide, please. So here's where we are now. Um, we are in the throes of actually uh, developing the orientation program for principals and candidates. And we are also in the throes of establishing the framework for mandatory minimum compensation. In relation to the orientation, we are actually focusing on those very relational competencies that are at the core of the challenges in articling. Um, half the battle is human beings. Uh, so, you know, learning how to manage others, learning how to coach others, how to provide feedback. Lawyers are good at a lot of things, but they're not good at everything, and nor, sh nor should they be. So if they're going to be in a situation where they're um, teaching and training someone, mentoring someone, there are skills that need to be learned. And, and especially when you're you know, balancing running a, a busy practice. Um, there's also uh, some focus on maintaining well-being and equality, diversity, and inclusion best practices. On the mandatory minimum compensation side, we do need to sort of determine the amount. Um, it is going to be a floor uh, and most of our placements are paid about you know, 10 to 15, 12, 14% are, are underpaid or paid below minimum wage. We will use the um, provincial minimum wage as a reference point uh, to set this floor. It'll be expressed in some kind of um, monthly or weekly amount. It will likely not be uh, tied to hours worked. I mean, it'll probably have to be based on a standard work week. We know that that is, you know, going to be challenging for some to accept. 
um, as some will say, well, you know, if you're working 60 hours a week, that's, you know, doesn't really amount to minimum wage, but we do need to start somewhere. Um, so here, my lesson here is, you know, start somewhere and, and, you know, iteratively move it forward as opposed to uh, getting bogged down and getting it perfect. Uh, we do have the principle, the right principle operating here, and we will continue to evaluate it. There will be uh, some kind of principle to framework for exemptions tied to placements likely that support access to justice, serve vulnerable populations, but cannot pay the minimum wage. That is also under development. And this will all be implemented by May 1st, 2023. Uh, fingers crossed. Next slide, please. I did want to mention that despite the fact that there are these challenges in articling and that you know we uh, are enhancing the article program to address some of them, we, the Law Society has a number of existing supports and programs for candidates and principals. And these are all links um, that address some of these more sensitive issues. Uh, particularly uh, proud of our Discrimination and Harassment Council program, which is a safe council program that allows uh, any member of the profession and indeed anyone who's been served by a profession to speak to council confidentially about uh, discrimination harassment issue. We have a member assistance program and some other programs there that I just wanted to draw to your attention. Next slide, please. So stepping back, um, I thought I'd just share some broad perspectives on multiple pathways and what it means to operate multiple pathways or sponsor multiple pathways from a regulatory perspective. And this is just, you know, our, our experience in Ontario. Um, first of all, I think it goes without saying that ongoing stakeholder engagement is critical. Our experience has been that most members of the profession will not take the time to understand the new pathways they will gravitate towards the process they went through themselves and what is familiar, and they will find ways to discredit the new pathway simply because it isn't familiar. I don't think it is necessarily a resistance to the pathway itself. Um, what this means is that as the regulator or sponsor of the pathways and participants in the pathway, um, we must engage in ongoing sustained engagement with stakeholders to socialize the new pathways and foster acceptance. Once you do that ribbon cutting, you're not done. You must continue to, to do that uh, because people are not paying attention and they may um, form you know, initial impressions. Again, when they evaluate the new, new pathway against what they did. And we can't do this alone, right? I mean, the, you know, the regulator can put a lot of things into play, but we do need the profession to participate. And it sounds like, uh, you know, just hearing from members of your uh, commenting public about the provisional licensure, uh, that there are some very willing and capable practitioners out there who are um, progressive and doing great things. And that's really exciting. Um, secondly, you know, nurture what you plant. Relatedly, you know, the enhancements we're putting into place for the articling and, and LPP program, I should mention those enhancements apply to both of those streams, are an example of the type of maintenance work that you need to do to ensure your programs remain viable and effective. Establishing the new pathways is actually the easy part. I know that probably sounds pretty crazy right now because you're very engaged in establishing and determining and deciding on those pathways, but actually it's once you have the pathways, um, I, I think the real work begins. And if I could continue the gardening analogy, uh, sometimes it's important to take time to cut back the overgrowth. So you may end up with multiple pathways with the view that they all need to live together, or you may see very clearly at some point that one of the pathways has to go, that maybe you know, the pathway that was the longstanding pathway that served us for so long is no longer applicable or as effective as the others. And that is a good thing because it means your new pathways have proven um, their worth, but it, it also means that you have to, you know, take, <laughs> take the overgrowth out and that's a challenging activity in and of itself. So in Ontario, funny enough, we have had articling for so long and there've been lots of um, proposals over the years questioning whether articling really is the best way. Would we do it that way if we were to design it today? And, you know, we have a law practice program, for instance, that is excellent 
uh, and we in some ways, you know, can see that it has a, it's a more consistent and effective way of supporting entry level competence. Um, you know, so will our things stay or go? That's for another day. Um, finally, the uh, or thirdly, the evaluation and assessment framework. You're probably already doing this, but if I could encourage you, if possible, to build a framework for collecting the metrics and the performance indicators that you'll use to evaluate the success of any new pathways from the outset rather than later on. Uh, I, I can't stress that enough. And you do need to invest in the evaluation as much as in the development of the new program itself. Decision makers and stakeholders will expect it and will need it. Um, and I do support the use of independent measurement and evaluation professionals as much as possible to bring credibility and expertise to the activity and, um, and, and to ensure that the uh, evaluation has integrity. And finally, resource impacts. Um, maintaining multiple pathways is a demanding exercise for everyone, especially for the regulator. You cannot do it off the side of your desk. It needs to be appropriately budgeted for and staffed to do it properly. Um, this is probably already something you can appreciate with all the work that you're all doing. Um, but once you have those multiple pathways, you will have to pay attention to all of them. So I would just encourage you to, to keep that in mind. Next slide, please. And um, on the subject of resources, I, I wanted to touch on the topic of licensing process fees. I understand this is an area of interest. Um, so in Ontario, at the Law Study of Ontario, we operate on a cost recovery basis like other public interest regulators. The costs of our day-to-day -day licensing operations are borne by candidates seeking licensure in a way of, in, in a manner of fees. And our approach has been that when we're introducing new pathways or programs for reasons of equity, the cost of those programs uh, or pathways are spread across all candidates not just the candidates participating in that particular pathway. So for example, in 2014, when we established the law practice program as an alternative to articling, the experiential training fee went up from $900 to $2,800 per candidate, regardless of whether the candidates were articling or doing the law practice program. And as I mentioned, the articling pathway remains the dominant pathway for candidates. This was a challenging change to weather and of course, uh, not something that candidates were particularly happy about, nor were law firms, because in some cases law firms are paying these fees. However, it was the, the decision was made to ensure that the pathway that was being established to ensure access to the profession wasn't going to be a barrier because of the you know disparity in cost. Um, and that is how we structured our fee. Another thing I'd mention is stability seems to work better than a fee that jumps around from year to year. Um, we find that fees are a flashpoint naturally with candidates who are dealing with significant debt loads. No one wants to see their licensing fees go up and down. However, I would just comment that we don't, you know, we see the scrutiny of law, you know, you pay all this fees at law school and then your licensing fees, you know, uh, $4,500 and there's a lot of scrutiny of that. But that aside, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, a group that is going to be price sensitive that is dealing with uh, significant debt, load, debt loads and that there will be significant criticism from stakeholders if fees bounce around a lot. So I think the one thing to think about is building fees in a way that, that is defensible, transparent, but that allows for some stability so that you're not having to defend that fee every year, that, that it will you know stay be stable for a few years. So you would have to build in some some room for, for inflationary increases and that sort of thing. And then I think we're on to my final slide, which is uh, an invitation to contact me at, certainly after or to ask questions now. Um, share them in your hands. Um, that's the end of my formal presentation today. Priya, thank you so much for um, the presentation. And um, it's uh, very much on point to some of the things that we're looking at. Um, so. We appreciate it. Um, we have time for some questions. I'm, I'm going to start um, and then uh, please raise your hand for others that have questions for Priya and we can um, flush out some of these issues. I guess I was most surprised. I'm just curious about the thought process around the decision to make the uh, training optional. Um, that that seemed like a, a, a choice that um, 
uh, uh, I, I wouldn't have expected. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the board, as I said, there was a turnover in governance, pretty significant turnover in 2019. So the board that decided that the training would be mandatory and the board that decided the training would be optional were very different, comprised of very different perspectives. There was certainly more of a small firm perspective in our new board, which I think made them more appreciative of sort of burden reduction um, opportunities. And so um, the, you know, and I do, I will send through Audrey, uh, all of the reports uh, that detail all of this. Um, so the thinking was that an optional training would be better received and perhaps maybe even more effective than something that people have to do. Whereas in Alberta, um, you may know already, they have a mandatory training for their article principles, which I think you can even access if you want to have a look at it. Um, so they've done a nice job with it. So yeah, very different perspective. This is an issue that we've discussed a number of times trying to find if that is a program in which we um, choose to recommend trying to find consistency and reliability around supervisors and um, and training has always been a, a main topic. Um, okay, with that, uh, Emily. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you so much, Priya. This was very, very helpful. Um, the one question I had is, and I may have missed this, so forgive me, but I did not hear anything about the option two enhancement that would have had the new skills examination at the end. So could you speak to that and maybe why that is or if that got wasn't voted in originally anyway? So in May, of course it was in the option two and then it was dropped by the time we got to December, 2018. And this was largely because the groups that were looking at, the group that, working group that was looking at the options was reviewing feedback that we were getting from the profession. And there was certainly a lot of resistance naturally from candidates to a skills exam. <laughs> and there wasn't a ton of support for the skills exam from members of the profession, partially because they probably maybe didn't you know, appreciate the value of it at that time. Um, so a decision was made along the way to drop that skills exam from option two and you'll see in the December 2018 report, the skills exam is sort of hived off. And it says, you know, we're going to look at this separately because this is still really important to us, but we're not going to tackle it right now because we've got to fix experiential training. And we still have not looked at the skills exam. It's been something that's sat on the side as a result of all the other things. My Lynn. Hi, thanks, Priya. I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, one kind of in the weeds question, you mentioned that the Law Society, I think you used the word governs the integrated practice curriculum. And I'm wondering, and, uh, I'm wondering what that means. What does that look like? The way it looks like it's kind of, kind of a hybrid, right? Because we don't govern law schools generally. I mean, we have, there's a national requirement that our federation, our national federation of law societies has in place. It's a high level, broad strokes requirement, but it is there and that governs all law schools in Canada. Uh, and, and then as a result of the fact that the integrated practice curriculum actually supports experiential training competencies that are normally covered in the, the licensing process, which we regulate, we have kind of a, a role in overseeing or being, you know, we have, I guess, authority over that component of the law school program because it's our experiential training requirement. How it really works in practice is we have regular dialogue with the two law schools that uh, provide the integrated practice curriculum. They report to us annually on their work placement outcomes and any changes to their curriculum, and they seek our approval for more significant changes that would impact the way they're delivering integrated practice curriculum. So it's formal, but there's a sort of art of, there's an art to it where, you know, we, we have an, a sort of an agreement. Um, they don't have to, uh, you know, formally reapply for accreditation every year or anything like that. It's more informal now that they're a bit of a proof. So all of that um, relates to sort of the input, what the law schools are um, covering with the students. Are, does the law society have some oversight over the output? Must the candidates demonstrate something to your satisfaction? 
So because we have, so what we've done is we've outsourced the evaluation of the experiential training competencies to the law schools. Like we have said, you evaluate them. We will continue to evaluate all candidates using our Ferris Terms Lister exam, which is not purely knowledge, there's application, but it's not a skills and task exam, right? So um, we have outsourced not only the, the input, the delivery, but also the evaluation of those assess of, and the assessment of those competencies, just like we have with the law practice programs. So we don't have an independent assessment. That's what the skill, there was a skills assessment that was supposed to sort of come into play at some point along the years to ensure that law practice program students, articling students, and any other students all had the requisite skills. That's what that was going to be for, but we haven't gotten there yet. Neil? Thanks, Chair. Um, hi, Priya. Thanks for your presentation. It was really, really helpful. Um, I had a question about the 2018 report in which um, uh, it was reported that half of uh, the licensees that are people of color reported agreeing strongly or somewhat they had struggled to find an articling position. Is, has the Law Society done anything in particular to sort of alleviate that concern? Well, I mean, I think all of our work in the EDI sphere, equality, diversity, inclusion sphere, is, has really been at that. And, and there, there are other initiatives that I didn't talk about today um, <coughs> that relate to that, including um, all licensees having to do, you know, an hour of CPD on equality, diversity, inclusion topics. Um, there have been, um, you know, the first few years of, of after the uh, a package of EDI recommendations came up. We all had to do three hours, actually. So there are other initiatives that are that are going on that are meant to address more broadly the receptiveness of the profession to you know diverse uh, candidates and diverse licensees. Um, and in particular, uh, we also monitor the, the recruitment process for article placements specifically, and of course. Uh, do our best to ensure that, you know, bias and implicit bias and, and is, is removed from that process as much as possible. Interestingly, the pandemic has opened up an opportunity there that, um, you know, there was a time when we don't, you'd see students traipsing down to the law firms for the cocktail parties and, and, and that sort of thing. And that's kind of where, frankly, uh, there's an opportunity for disparities to emerge. Someone who has a background in country club might have an advantage in a cocktail party than someone who's not, who's a first generation lawyer, right? From a different community. The law firms, the big Bay Street law firms have told us they wanna stick with this. They don't wanna do, uh, they don't wanna go back to like infirm parties and cocktail activities and things like that. They're also having, they're able to access candidates who are maybe disabled, who may, you know, so, so it's been an interesting area of progress, but our work in that area continues. It's, I think it's bigger than just the article forum. It's dealing with the profession as a whole. And I'm happy to send a link to the initiatives we have on, on that front when I send everything else over to Audrey. Great, thanks. I, I have a second question. So my understanding is that in, in Ontario, this, your pathway to licensure still involves some kind of exam. Could you tell us a little bit more about that exam and, uh, um, and if there's ever been any talk about removing that component? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I, you know, I noted when I was reviewing the work you're doing is that you're talking about alternatives to the exam, whereas we're talking about alternative experiential training pathways that sit aside an exam and that, right. you know, that there's a difference there. So we have two examinations, a barrister examination, a solicitor examination. They're four hours long. Uh, there are multiple choice and they are open book. Um, we shortened those exams from seven hours to four hours actually during the pandemic, uh, probably another permanent change. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there are, are always views on whether the law society should be administering an exam. You know, law schools are doing such a good job. This is duplicative. Uh, this is, you know, creates burdens, but we actually do, and I think our board and you know, views the examination as an important component of ensuring entry level confidence um, that, you know, it's, um, you know, our obligation in the public interest to do that. Uh, the interest in reforming the exam certainly is there. And I think that's well founded. You know, it's um, ideally we would be getting at more skills and we would be um, 
involving the exam along those lines or, you know, in some way, but we are, um, you know, we all know what, what, how, how, what a big undertaking that is. So I'd say that the exam has remained relatively stable um, throughout this, but it will be a matter of time before we return to it because it has served us well um, for certainly for 15 years, but um, we're certainly watching what the NCB is doing, for instance, um, with the next gen bar exam. See where they take that. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but. No, you did. Okay. Leah. Hi, I also had questions. So the solicitor, everybody has to take both the solicitor's and the barrister's exam, and they can take them when? So you can take any time after you admitted to the licensing process. So to be admitted to the licensing process, you need a law degree, and you, or you need a certificate of qualification if you're an international student. Uh, so you come to us, you register for the licensing process, and there are three sittings of the licensing exam per year currently. So you can register for your exam before your experiential training. You can do one exam, do your experiential training, and then do your exam. You can do an exam during your articles if you want, if you're able to study and work at the same time. So you have three years to complete everything. Okay, got it. And then and they're both open book. They are. Yeah. Okay. And do people take them from home or they take them at like a testing center? So we used to do them uh, in sort of event-based venues that we kind of build our own testing center. And then with the pandemic, we went online and now we're back to in-person um, testing. They're not, it's not a ProMetric or Pearson View testing center. It's our own, but uh, we are looking at actually moving them to those kinds of testing centers. Okay. All right. And then on a totally different front, um, is there any incentive for firms or attorneys to take on a, um, an intern or to do supervised practice, either financial or continuing legal education credits or anything? Do, are there any incentives at all? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually offer a full 12 hours of CPD credit for being an article principal. Um, so we have always recognized that it is it's, it's not simply that it's, you know, we need our principles, but there actually is learning that goes on on both sides um, and the professional development. And so it is, uh, yeah, full, you're going to get your full 12 hours that way. Okay. And the three hours of professionalism, well, chances are you're going to be talking about some ethics and practice management issues and you're, you know, if you're going to supervise a candidate, so you do have to fulfill that as well, but it can be fulfilled through our claim. You just have to get that part accredited. Okay. Great, thank you. Susan, do you have a question? Yes, just to follow up on Neil's question, could you give us just a sort of general, and I know that there will be differences and disparities, but what's the average pass rate for the barristers and solicitors exams? Yeah, um, so our pass rate is around 80% on the first attempt. Uh, so it's fairly strong, but if you break that down by education pathway, <laughs> our domestically trained or educated candidates are going to pass at an average of 90% versus our internationally trained at sort of 50%. First time pass rate, which we see as indicative. Okay, great. Um, any additional questions? I have just one thing about timing. If someone doesn't find a placement, article in placement, is that when they can choose the law? practice program or do they have to have a, a specific timing? No, you can choose a law practice program at the outset and we would love it if more candidates did choose it because it is a very good form of training and we do see candidates uh, actually during the pandemic more candidates chose the law practice program um, but you can if you don't if you want to try to find an article placement you are going to have to wait till the next intake of the law practice program which is every fall uh, we don't have multiple intakes for that program so but there is no waiting period. And I should have mentioned, Audrey, I think you wanted me to speak to this, I apologize. Um, people find their own article placements, <clears throat> but we have an organized recruitment that NALP, you know, kind of runs, um, I'm probably familiar with, the, with National Association of Law Placement, um, Canadian Arm as well. Uh, you know, the law firms get together and there are certain days, uh, you know, timelines for applications. Everything is quite structured. Outside of that, candidates can still find jobs, and they do uh, into third year law school. And of course, we do offer a, a registry at the Law Society, which is still listing positions. 
way back in the day, we had a matching program, which we no longer have. Um, okay, great. Alex, it looks like you may have a question. I do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Priya. This is very useful. Uh, just one final question. I, I realize in the 2018 paper, it reflects a total cost of $7,000, not including, I think, tax. Can you speak to that amount? Um, I, I know that amount sort of reflects a discount. Um, by the commission, uh, I'm sorry, from, from the profession where, you know, probably a million dollar was contributed. So without that number, how much do you think it will cost for applicants to select and complete option two? Well, it tends, so, I mean, our, our, our math is $4,710 plus 13% tax. So, you know, it is, yeah, it's, it's it, it, you know, nears up close, close to, you know, what you're saying, 7,000. If we were to take the, $1 million contribution away, um, which is $25 per licensee, it tends to increase the licensing fee both by about $300, if I recall correctly. We have to use sort of a you know baseline number of the number of full fee equivalent licensing candidates we have. So it's not an insignificant amount. Got it, thank you. Okay, any additional questions? Great. Um, Bria, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Um, would you mind if we shared your slides with the, with the group? Not at all. Although I want to, I want to ask either Audrey, we have to, I, there's one thing I have to correct on that once I had the date wrong and I, I might, change. You, you can change it. So it was May 1st, 2021 for that. <laughs> and then I will send Audrey the links or, or the reports that seem to be of interest in some of the links about some of the things you've all asked me about for more information. So yes, absolutely. Feel free to share, share the deck. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. I'm going to have a great day. Okay. Bye. Great. Thanks, Priya. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Um, all right, folks, we're going to do just a really quick break before we dive into the next item, uh, only because it's going to, once we get started on it, it's going to take some time. So if we can just do uh, 10 minutes and we'll come back, we're going to uh, begin with uh, item B. Um, which is the discussion and potential recommendation for a non-exam pathway to licensure. So we'll be back in uh, 10 minutes.
All right, Devin, let's go ahead and get started again. Okay. Um, Josh Pertula? Present. Susan Bakshian? Present. David Boyd? Present. Charles, uh, sorry, Alex Chan? Present. Charles Dugan? Charles Dugan? Jeremy Evans? Here. Jackie Gardina? Here. Dr. Henderson? Here. Esther Lynn? Here. Tracy Montez? Here. Natalie Rodriguez? Here, and I just see Charles logging in. Okay, Charles Dugan? Here, thank you. Uh, Emily Savaletto? Here. Karen Silverman? Here. Mylon Spencer? Here. And Amy Williams? Present. We have a quorum. Great. Thank you. All right, folks. Um, thank you for staying on time and on task. Appreciate it. Uh, we are going to move to business item B, discussion and potential recommendation for a California non-exam pathway to licensure. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Audrey, um, who's going to kind of walk us through some of the history here and what we, um, where we left off at the last meeting. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you, Josh. Um, okay. One second. Okay. Um, so discussion and recommendation for a California non-exam pathway to licensure. Um, there was the agenda item posted, um, pretty thorough recap and lots of attachments on where, how we got here to date. We've heard presentations from Deborah Merritt, Joan Howarth, who uh, talked about improvements that can be made to licensure exams for uh, minimum attorney competence and also bar exam alternatives. Uh, we've looked at the Daniel Webster Scholars Honor Program out of the University of New Hampshire Law School, where they have an application process where a small cohort do a different uh, curricula in second and third year. We heard from Wisconsin, uh, where they have diploma privilege for their two ABA law schools. Uh, we've heard from the Oregon Task Force representative a couple of different times. Um, about their OEP, the Oregon Experiential Pathway, that's um, heavily modeled on the Daniel Webster Scholars Program, and their SPP, the Supervised Practice um, Program. Uh, we've heard from Canadian provinces, Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario now again today, and we heard from a representative of the PrEP Program, which is a training course used by four of the Canadian provinces. So that's just a very high level, quick summary of all uh, sort of the background on some alternative ways uh, to test for minimum competence. So where we left um, in July, we had three options that uh, the group moved forward to this meeting. Um, option one, no change to the program of legal education meaning no additional unit or course requirements, but the six experiential education units already required will be modified to meet the CAPA requirements for skills and abilities. A post-graduation supervised practice period between 750 and 1500 hours. And then a summative capstone portfolio at the conclusion of the supervised practice period to be reviewed and scored by the regulator. So that's option one. Uh, we also moved forward option two, a non-exam pathway introduced during law school with expanded doctrinal and experiential education requirements also modified to reflect CAPA. So this option would increase the requirements at a state bar regulated curricular path for California law schools that would diverge at some point from the standard law school curriculum to cover additional externships, practica, simulations, and clinics. So this option also includes the post-graduation supervised practice period between 750 and 1500 hours and that summative capstone portfolio. Finally, there's option three. Again, no change, similar to option one with the law school requirement to the program of legal education, but the six required units would be modified to meet the CAPA requirements. A post-graduation supervised practice period between 750 and 1500 hours, and then a California 
preparation uh, readiness program, similar to the one used in several Canadian provinces with online modules, in-person workshops, simulated law firm, in-person capstone to be completed concurrently with the supervised practice period. So these are the options that we left um, in July to circle back to today. Um, and basically they, they all have three main components, the law school component, supervised practice component, and the assessment component. Um, so looking at these discrete components and kind of unpacking, we have the law school component. So we have three options, but really the law school part is either choice A, no change to the program of legal education, but the six units already required will be modified to meet the CAPA requirements, or choice B, an expanded um, educational requirement, a non-exam pathway that starts in law schools. Great, Audrey, let, let's, yeah. uh, let's stop there for a moment. Um, can you go back one slide for one second? So with all of the um, conversation in July that we had, um, Audrey's broken it down into the three main components, and there's obviously a number of questions and issues around every one of these, and that's what we want to dig into a little bit. Um, but, but the first one is what, what role the law school plays. And then um, Audrey, can go one, one more slide forward, please. You were just on. And so the two main options that we discussed on the uh, law schools were um, whether or not it stays status quo with the uh, six units um, and has kappa requirements or whether or not there is some modification to it um, and it becomes a more robust um, uh, expanded doctrinal experiential education, again, reflecting the kappa skills and abilities. So I think um, I'd like to start the conversation around uh, this, uh, there's no perfect way to go about this. Um, we're going to break it down and we can come back at any point to the different um, aspects and characteristics. Uh, we'll start here and then we'll, we will move to the uh, 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 practice um, and then to the assessment. Um, okay, uh, Natalie, looks like you have a question. Just a quick request. Would it be possible to have these slides sent to us right now um, so sure. that we can follow with the, the details? Sure. Thank you. Great. So uh, let me start with uh, just opening it up on, now we've had some time uh, to think about it. We went through the three options. Um, any comments on uh, the law school portion um, on whether or not between those two options, there's one that um, we think as a group or individually at this point would be uh, most beneficial to a program. Mylin? Just as a preliminary comment with um, what was be the expanded version of the law school pathway. I don't know that we've talked about whether that would need to be the, um, that would be mandatory or optional. To me, I've been envisioning the possibility of the supervised practice could start as early as law school, or you could meet some of those requirements in law school, but that we wouldn't necessarily have to recommend that a one size fits all, that every candidate who wants a non-exam pathway must start it um, at a certain point in law school. So I guess that's a preliminary question I have. And then I have, um, I, I, I do have my personal thoughts on um, the value of an experiential pathway that starts in law school, um, which I'm happy, happy to get into, but I, um, I'm, I guess I'm seeking clarification on that first point first. Um, I'm not sure I can give it to a degree that is going to satisfy you. Unfortunately, these elements, um, I think as you think through them, there's so many different um, machinations as, as a possibility. Uh, and so the question becomes, um, you know, on, on the next element, we start talking about whether or not it starts at law school. That's a conversation. Um, and I think some people had an opinion on whether it should start at law school or um, it should start after law school. Um, and we can go back. That's the reason I said we can go back to it. Um, but I don't, I don't know that there's a linear way to go through this with so many different elements. Um, it yes. looks like Leah has her hand up. Let me go ahead and call on her because she may have a, a suggestion that I'm missing. Well, not as such. I have a question. Um, 
do I just don't recall when did the integrated practice program uh, that we just heard about that you don't have to kind of sign up for that at the beginning of law school what it's it's a one year program is that right no it starts in the first year of law school so the law school is applied to have a curriculum um, approved to um, from the first year on experiential curriculum different to the other law schools in Ontario. And that, that pathway um, means you don't need to do articling or the law practice program. Right, but I, but I thought she said, if you wanted to, um, you know, decided that you wanted to opt into that model, you, you, would, you could do so, but you'd have to wait till the fall. Oh, so that's, that the law, that's the law practice program. Yeah, that's the, the law practice program. That's four months uh, training course. Oh, okay. So not the integrated. The integrated starts at the beginning of law school. That's okay. Right. All right. Yeah. So I'm. this isn't that uh, helpful, Josh. I was just curious if the, if the Ontario um, paradigm might be useful here, but I don't think well, so. in order to get um, some conversation around this going and we can move on and come back, I mean, I, I will tell you, um, as I have thought about this, um, I think, first of all, it's essential that um, any uh, experiential having uh, in law school would be specific to Kappa. That, that would be important to me. Um, and then in addition, um, the question has been, you know, is the requirement for experiential enough um, and this is an, as I understand it, this is an ABA requirement, um, but it, but, but it may be larger than that. Um, but it's, but it's, uh, it's a requirement that um, is limited in, in number of hours. And so the question would be, are we comfortable with those number of units? And I think on our conversation, some people have uh, in the past um, have made some compelling arguments that those units are not a lot of hours. Um, and they can be satisfied pretty quickly. And so I would be more comfortable making sure that we have experiential at a, at a level um, that would give people more experience even going into a supervised practice. Uh, Emily? So my sense on this with the, um, I, and I understand we have sort of A and B here, but I, I do think that, um, so just looking at the exam pathway, law school, if California adopts what we have proposed, law schools are gonna to have to change what they do with experiential education. Um, if we adopt a non-exam pathway and we don't say to law schools or to law, to law students, you have to take 10 units, you have to take 12 units. With what you're talking about, law schools are still gonna to have to change what they do with experiential education and because we're gonna to have to prepare our students to be much more skill focused for either the exam or the non-exam pathway. So I, I would say that, you know, whether we decide it's the six units that we have or we say we want 10 units or again, 12 or whatever, I, I think that to me is less important than where we end up with with what it's going to take to have a non-exam pathway like that supervised practice can you do some of that in law school can you you know can you start in your third year i mean yeah your last semester um you know i guess there's more options than just six units or more um and so i would maybe ask to i'm putting that out there but that is to say maybe we do come back and visit this once we've talked about what a supervised practice and even what an assessment looks like. I mean, the idea that that Ontario gives us of sort of, you know, signing up for this program and being able to like kind of do some things early on based on what they've learned in law school is an attractive idea if we're going to continue on this non-exam pathway. pathway. Um, so I would just say like, maybe we do come back and revisit after this discussion. Okay, I, I mean, I have one comment, then we'll turn to Mylin for a question. And if we don't have any others, we can move to um, supervised practice and then come back um, uh, and, we can, and we can move throughout. I mean, I understand that they're not that mutually exclusive and they all kind of tie together at some point. Um, I, I, I will say, um, Emily, I've never been um, personally convinced as much that 
uh, the law schools will have dramatic changes even with the test that we have. Yes, it will take um, some changing, but it's not a required change. It would be you know, uh, their ability to try to figure out how they prepare students the best for the exam, which is exactly what we don't want, right? Don't don't prepare for the exam. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure you're going to see um, dramatic change, and it may be over time. And I think what we're talking about here is because of a different path, dramatic change. I mean, it would be part of the curriculum would be um, mandating uh, that that uh, uh, be done immediately uh, in order to go through the program. Uh, Mylin? I guess I'll just go on record as um, supporting the expanded requirements within law school, uh, whether it's optional or uh, whether it's optional or not, um, for the following reasons that we already have. To, to me, it makes sense that we use what we already have, which is a lot of infrastructure, a lot of capacity for training and assessment within law schools, why not harness that for the licensing process rather than pushing the bulk of it to supervised practice where it's possible? I recognize that there are all different kinds of law schools in our state and that some may be better positioned to provide an in-depth experiential um, curriculum. I am at a school where we have a very strong experiential program and there wouldn't be, it would be a question of scale, right? Increasing um, the requirements, increasing the, the menu options for students and, and having a curriculum where I, 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 to me, I'm not sure it makes sense to have to select in your 1L year, but certainly by the beginning of your 2L year, whether you're going to follow this path. Um, so, so my um, strong sense is that we should have the pathway start in law school as an option. And, and the way to do that, I think, is by um, bumping up those experiential units, because as people probably know, six is, you know, each unit is only 45 hours during the semester. It really isn't that much. Um, uh, two quick comments. One, um, Mylan, thank you very much for sharing your opinion. Uh, that very helpful and um, hopefully will spark some conversation around it. So I very much appreciate that. Um, second, just uh, I, I want to do some level setting for everybody. I know there are some folks that um, are, are less comfortable around some of the non-exam uh, pathways. And so we're going to have this conversation. And when we get to recommendation, I, I don't want to leave off that if there is a uh, consensus that this isn't the right path for some folks, that is also an option. Um, uh, if any of these don't work for you, that's also an option. It will be part of our um, final conversation. So uh, uh, please know that also. Um, any more comments specific to um, law school? And then I will I will move on. Yes, Jackie. So I, I... I'm, I'm with my Lynn with, with perhaps a, a hybrid approach. I mean, one thing I want to make sure, and this goes back to what I think Emily said earlier, which is, uh, and what Dr. Henderson has emphasized when it comes to a non-exam pathway, is we still need that kind of breadth of knowledge. Um, and what we're seeing in some of the supervised practice experience with the PLLs is that it, it's got a, a very deep knowledge in a particular area. Um, but not necessarily the breadth of knowledge that that Kappa requires. So um, that law schools will have to adjust to make sure that we've got that breadth of knowledge um, being taught. I think one way as we move to the supervised practice question is not so much a requirement that it start in law school for the reasons Mylin identified is not all law schools may have the ability to offer, let's say, an in-house clinic experience or students don't have the opportunity to have an entire semester in practice because of their own lives. But perhaps we could say that um, a certain number of the hours that are required in supervised practice could be started in law school. Um, and we could put a limit on that, 20% uh, or 10% or something like that. And that allows students who are attending a law school um, who do have the ability for those kind of clinic and other uh, immersive experiences to potentially shorten the um, postgraduate time 
in supervised practice. And so it allows for a somewhat hybrid approach um, for those schools who may not have the ability to provide uh, kind of the, the clinical or experiential program beyond maybe simulations and some externships. Thank you. Emily? I just wanted to say I'm on board with what Jackie just said. I think that's the type of thing that I that she did much better at articulating than I, which is the ability for students to, and law schools, to create what is going to help students meet our, the hour requirement um, in a in a multitude of ways, but is also not necessarily mandatory for students. We just we just have a lot of students that are not going to take the bar in California, and a lot of law schools in California do. So, having the ability, especially for people to choose, and they're even starting in their third year, that they've said, "Yes, I am going to be in California. I do want to stay here. I do want to take this bar." For somebody to to have had to have chosen that in their two L year, that would that would be problematic for for I think a lot of law schools and a lot of students. So I would just say, I, I like the idea of the option for there to be a certain number of hours uh, on that supervised practice realm to, to do that. Okay. Audrey, let's, let, let, let's turn to the next slide if we can, which is specific to supervised practice. Um, I think there's, and, and, and we can come back. Um, in all three of the um, alternatives that we discussed uh, and we um, uh, took a, a, a straw poll on last meeting, it had supervised practice as a um, uh, important part of it. And I think so the, the question around supervised practice has additional questions. This is only intended to raise some of them, but others will want to will want to bring them up. I think what I'd like to do is try to iron out a couple of the important aspects of supervised practice that um, we can maybe build a consensus. One of the main ones is, you know, what is the length of time? Um, and so I think we need to get to try to get to consensus on that. The second one is obviously uh, what we were just discussing, which is at law school or post-graduation. Uh, and then um, there have been many issues raised, which I think are very serious issues, which um, I don't know that we will have all the solutions for, and uh, we may want to address in our recommendation that they needed that they need to be, um, you know, watched carefully and mitigated. Uh, or if there's specific um, changes we can suggest, we will we'll recommend we should do that. So with that, uh, anybody want to jump in on um, supervised practice and what they believe the required amount of time is? And we did touch on this a little bit last time. Susan? I think one of the important issues on the number of hours is that we try to make sure that it mirrors the exam licensing process so that we don't require a number of hours that will put these applicants behind the sort of November licensure that someone taking the exam expects. So I think this is also one of those things where it's more important to have quality than quantity. I mean, I'd rather have 750 really well done supervised hours by a well trained supervisor than 1500 by somebody with less training. And so I think that if we do the hours correctly, they can mirror the licensure time frame of taking the exam so that we don't create some artificial distinctions there that aren't necessary. And I do think that if we do the hours correctly, some portion of them, I agree with Jackie, can be in law school. I don't believe they all can be. But I do believe we could let students get started and that that's, I think, a nice way to offset the problem of dealing with anything that would require an in law school election is to, to make these hours, some of them available in law school for those who do elect, but not a required curriculum election. Neil. Yeah, just some quick observations. Uh, the Oregon proposed program, I think they are proposing something like 1500 hours. The basis of that proposal is based on what the Canadian provinces do, which is about 10 months, and I think in Ontario's case, eight months. Um, and if you're talking about eight months, then we're talking about 1250 in terms of hours. Uh, and uh, about studying for the bar exam, you know, unfortunately, it's going to be a little more difficult to figure out what that means, because this commission is obviously making recommendations about that exam that will change it. It may change how soon it's graded. It could change how, how many hours are, are actually required. Um, so just observations that are out there. 
Uh, Amy. Thank you, Joshua. My concern is not so much with the hours. We had several public commenters earlier today say that they've done 1,000 hours here, 2,000 hours there. But we know that the reality of casework, cases aren't resolved in a week. They're not resolved in a month. They may not even be resolved in a year. So for me, knowing how much specific time is being spent learning a specific type of task on a specific type of case with specific sets of issues, that to me needs to be a little more specified for me to feel comfortable saying that this person has sufficient experience and has put in a sufficient number of hours to learn that skill set in that specific circumstance or case. I think that, you know, with, with Canada, I remember when I first bought my home in 2004, because I'm a, I'm, I'm a dual resider in the States and Canada, I was first told that I would have to article for six years. And I said, forget that. I will not get my license in Canada, thank you very much. And this was in British Columbia. And this was 20 years ago. Uh, I'm sure the circumstances have changed. But I worry about not only the amount of hours spent on a specific type of case or skill set or issue or type of law, but also who's going to regulate these supervisors. That to me is still a very important issue. We don't want someone just you know going through the motions we want we want these these candidates to get the very best possible supervision and mentoring that they need to be able to learn and be confident in these skill sets this is amy and i'm done speaking audrey can you before um i turn to tracy can you address um the oversight and the thought process of the the current staff at the bar has around supervised oversight Yes, and, and um, we talked about it in July, and I put it in the item today, but that the vetting and the training of the supervisors would be regulated by, by the state bar. So we do, we do have that in mind for supervised practice. And um, it, one of Amy's uh, uh, concerns, um, it, like everything, right, we're moving on to, to kind of the next issue, which is the assessment portion. Um, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I don't disagree with um, the comment Susan made and the comment that Amy made around, you know, pretty much trying to find the quality time. Um, and, I, and so I think that that's a whole nother uh, portion of um, our recommendation is making sure that the, we have supervisors, that they are qualified, that they're trained, that, they're over, that there's oversight, um, and that uh, depending on what the uh, uh, next assessment is some of the work may start in that supervised practice for the assessment portion. Um, Tracy. Yes, thank you very much. And um, I just wanted to say that, again, consistent with other comments, I think some of the specifics need to be finalized at a later date, and maybe we work toward a shell of the components to be included with a number or a kind of a list of things to be considered. For example, the number of hours, we may not be able to decide the exact number of hours because that's gonna be based on the other de decisions with regard to law school and um, assessment. The same thing with um, supervisors or the type of supervision, we just bullet out components that need to be considered to address disparities and things like that. I do though support um, the supervised practice both during school and post-graduation. I think that that's helpful um, and that would hopefully address availability of supervisors by having multiple options. That's my comments, thank you. So let me let me just address that comment for one moment. I mean, I, I could see um, again if we can come to consensus on it. The concept uh, on hours um, that we make a recommendation that has something uh, says something about uh, a goal to make the path timeline consistent between um, both an exam and non-exam pathway uh, consistent in timing for licensing. That was a comment that uh, Neil made earlier, and I'm sure a, a broad statement like that would be um, sufficient for. Uh, whatever uh, the court decides and if there was a uh, executing body that would uh, uh, try to implement. Natalie? 
So I like the um, that in the program that we just heard about that for those that are supervising, they receive CLE credit. I think that would encourage more supervisors, but I also think that that's a way to ensure that the supervisors are getting adequate training. I could see as part of the CLE credit bearing that there would be programs that they have to complete as supervisors um, so that everyone is on the same page about what it is that we're expecting from the supervisors. Um, so I think there's a beautiful way to regulate this without it becoming so um, su such a burden that we're actually keeping people from wanting to participate in the program. Um, so just something to note that I thought that was something we really should consider as part of the non-exam pathway. Uh, Jackie? Yeah, I just had a question for either Tracy or Dr. Henderson. We wanted this to be evidence-based and do we have any information from other disciplines that require um, a certain number of hours of practice, kind of why they've chosen the number that they have? This, this is Tracy. I'm happy to chime in. So many of our Department of Consumer Affairs do have supervised experience. And again, um, they will have a group of subject matter experts come in, work together. These are licensees. And they will look at, again, what is expected uh, for minimum competency entry level. Again, looking at the multiple requirements for licensure and then make reasonable judgments again, trying to balance out the other expectations that must be achieved, whether it's an exam, uh, educational requirements, degree requirements. And it's, it's really a very thoughtful analytical process, again, tying back to that occupational or job analysis so that it can be defended. But it's, you know, again, much of what we're hearing today, that balance, what is reasonable, that's not going to create a barrier to licensure but yet meets those expectations. So I um, can't give you any specifics other than tell you it is a methodological approach um, that is done. And it sounds like, Tracy, that's why you're recommending that this is something that, that might need uh, an additional step in place rather than our group trying to make that determination to actually uh, perhaps develop a uh, yes, there will be ex uh, supervised practice, but that amount of hours will be determined by subject matter experts through a methodology to be determined later. I, I think so. Again, I think a, a, a broad recommendation is fine, you know, a range. And as um, was mentioned earlier by Joshua, you know, saying that it's trying to mirror the pathway of the exams. I think that's fine. But actually saying, you know, 750 hours. I think would be hard to do in this committee, but arrange some guidance would be would, would be what I would recommend. Other issues, does anybody have any thoughts on um, mandatory mandatory versus optional training uh, or compensation that were discussed on, um, uh, in the earlier presentation? All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share mine then as we, as we continue. Um, I mean, some people might've heard from my question. I, I, uh, I don't think um, optional training is optional. Uh, I think uh, to, to have a program like this, if we were to make a recommendation and they were to adopt it, I think um, it would have to be a, a mandatory. Everyone would need to understand uh, the objectives um, and the expectations around it. Um, and so that would be something that potentially could be done uh, by the bar. I had not really thought about compensation before, but I do think it's a it's a big issue we need to discuss. I mean, there are folks coming out with very large debt, and um, uh, you can say that others are uh, uh, spending the time to study for the bar exam, but a lot of those people are working at the same time and getting paid to do it, although you know part time, etc. Um, and this would be a commitment of time uh, during uh, that they would that they potentially wouldn't get paid for, and so there's a fairness and equity, and uh, that I think we need to think about. Uh, Dr. Henderson. Thank you, Joshua. Um, I have two uh, points to make. The, the first is uh, uh, not only do I think that training for supervisors has to be mandatory, but I believe that 
there needs to be a requirement that spells out uh, the structure of the supervised training, that there needs to be a list of uh, skill components based on the CAFA um, practice analysis that um, details what it should cover. Um, the uh, other point is uh, to what you just talked about, uh, Joshua, um, compensation. The supervisors need to be obligated to the state. And so some compensation, even a small amount, uh, would create the uh, expectation that they are responsible to the state, to the public in uh, their supervisory work. So I'm all about compensating the supervisors as well as requiring their training. My Lynn. Uh, I would agree on the mandatory training and very structured um, based on Kappa training for all the reasons already articulated. I think, and, and this is based on my supervising externships for 10 years now, uh, the training of supervisors is important, but equally, if not more important, is the monitoring. And I liked what Priya said. She didn't give us much detail, but what she said about risk-based approach to monitoring the placements, because there are some placements that are going to be great. They're going to stay great. And then there are supervisors who may either um, be constantly changing or may just not be good at providing feedback, providing formative assessment. Uh, and I think that it's going to fall to the bar to, to do, have that monitoring function, which is absolutely critical in my view. Susan. I want to come back to Josh, your comment about the compensation. I think all of us in a perfect world would very much like to see folks compensated. Um, but I also think that the presentation we heard today made it clear that that's a very long range, very detailed kind of problem that cannot have a quick or easy resolution. I feel that a lot of the non-exam pathway discussion in general comes down to the old adage of don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, and I do think that what we need to come up with here is a big picture recommendation. And again, that it will be important to point out all of the issues we've identified but I think we do the commission a disservice and we don't meet our goals of what the court has asked us to do if we become overly focused in all of the small details that the commission's not prepared to, to make a recommendation on. If, if we don't stay focused on that bigger picture non-exam pathway and its importance. And in particular, I wanted to respond to your comment that on compensation that many people studying for the exam work at least part time. I want to challenge that and say I don't believe that that's true, at least not in those that are successful. It has been my experience, and I believe there is some recent data reported in the literature that says folks who work too much while that work more than very little or not at all do not pass the exam when studying for it. So I think we have to be careful to not assume that folks studying for the exam somehow have an option to work. Many, many of the successfully first time pass candidates do not work and are uncompensated. So while that is not ideal, while I would prefer to see compensation for those in a supervised path, I think it's important to recognize the reality of the exam path too. Let me uh, let me just address that for a moment. Susan, that may be true. I, I, I don't have the, uh, the direct knowledge on some of that, but I do know um, that uh, on the, in the exam path, you take the exam and you have some months where you're waiting for your, your test results. And during that time, you could work either in the law profession or otherwise, um, just uh, in, in order to create some uh, compensation and income during that time. And I think you would not have that ability. Um, so I'm, I do agree with you that raising these issues um, uh, and highlighting them in many cases will be a better approach than trying to solve them because we don't have all the answers um, and it'll take a little more study. Um, but I think I think we're starting to get some framework around uh, the supervised practice. So um, I'm gonna hear from a few more people and then I'm gonna make a suggestion on, on, on what I think I heard. Jeremy. Thank you, Josh, I appreciate it. Um, so I kind of wanted to sit back and, and, uh, and, and listen and, um, and hear everybody out. And, you know, obviously we've, we've gone through this now for 
Um, we've seen so many different reports and everything else. And uh, it's been such a great uh, commission and experience uh, to work on with y'all, with everybody on this. I guess I wanted just to, um, you know, express sort of some thoughts that I've had and have with regard to the non-exam pathway and sort of what my thinking is. Uh, so I think sort of where I'm at now, I'm going to be voting against, um, you know, any non-exam bar pathway. And, and I think where this comes from is that um, sort of looking at the history of this, you know, we've lowered the cut score. We've reduced the exam from three days to two. Um, you know, I really sort of, and I know this is a focus, not of our group, but would love to see maybe more of an open book, open note and online options for a test. I think that's something that, um, you know, from my personal opinion could get, could get behind. Uh, I loved uh, how the first subgroup, you know, decided on a California specific exam. I think that's the way to go. I love the idea of adding civility and ethics and possible reduction of MBEs. Um, I think one of the disappointing things that I would have liked to have seen is maybe a joint approach. I would have loved to have seen um, uh, an exam or some sort of reduced exam with an apprenticeship program or a supervised uh, you know, thing that we've been talking about versus getting rid of a test altogether. I, you know, if we looked at the Ontario example that was just mentioned, even there, there was like two exams that were required. And of course, even with the bar, you still have to take the MBE or the um, the the multi you know the professional responsibility exam. So again, I'm not going to support uh, a non-exam pathway, and I just wanted to report in too that the um, California Lawyers Association Governmental Affairs Committee, which is the committee that reviews um, any sort of legislation or state bar changes to the exam um, through the through the California Supreme Court, of course that they voted unanimously last week on Friday to uh, against a non-exam pathway. And of course, um, it's been mentioned previously that 25 other bar associations have opposed this, uh, a non-exam pathway. And I'm fairly certain, uh, almost um, completely certain that the full CLA board is going to vote against a non-exam pathway when they vote in a couple of weeks. And then I'll sort of close with a couple other thoughts as to why uh, in addition to why I'm against a non-exam pathway. I think supervision is going to be an issue. Um, I, I think that there's going to be this sort of division between choosing a non-exam over an exam. Um, I think there's probably going to be a division in the marketplace between exam takers and non-exam takers. And again, maybe that's not reflected on the state bar website on your profile, probably not, probably would be a bad idea, uh, but it's just something to think about. I also think that we need to wait to see what happens to the exam that we're going to be creating and changing and using um, tremendous amount of uh, state bar staff uh, to put towards creating and managing that exam before we enter into or introduce a completely additional uh, program. So again, I think one of the other issues I want to mention is that, you know, one of the frustrations, at least for me, has always been that the ABA approves or gives accreditation to law schools based on bar exam passage rates. So I think that, you know, to me has always been an issue. And I, I wonder if the, really the pathway to law school should be changed in that way, in terms of um, how people are accepted, what tests they have to take, who gets in, who doesn't, and, and you know, basically how they're trained. I mean, I've, I've always thought that the best law school in the country under the current model would be a law school that taught nothing but the bar exam get rid of all the extracurriculars and just teach the bar exam. It'd be the most popular law school in the country, um, you know, in terms of if, if your role was to just pass the exam. So I, again, I think we need standards. I think we need a test. I think a test is the best way to do it. I think I like what this commission has done to look at revising the exam. Um, you know, and again, I go back to the regulation piece. I know that, um, you know, I love the state bar staff. We have a great relationship with the state bar, both personally and with the CLA. But, you know, again, I think regulating attorneys from that standpoint, in addition to regulation of uh, malpractice and those types of issues, uh, and plus who would pay for the training? Because I know one of the things that law firms have done, and I'll close on this thought, Josh, and to everybody on the commission, and sorry for taking so long. But one of the um, things that law firms have done is they've cut back on training. 
And so where would lawyers, particularly solo practitioners or, or um, sort of mid sort of mid-sized law firms find uh, the time or the money to uh, to do this sort of supervised practice. But uh, anyway, those are those are my thoughts, but I just wanted to be clear with everybody that I'm going to be voting against a, a non-exam pathway. Thanks. I appreciate the thoughts. Um, I will say, um, you know, I hope as we get there, Jeremy, you have an opportunity to look at uh, some of the recommendations and, uh, you know, take a, a, a new look at it. I mean, I think the goal here um, is to make recommendations that could be um, as minimal as, uh, you know, looking into some of these other ones. This is our, this is the chance to do it. So um, I have a very open mind about what the possibilities are, but I share some of the same concerns you do. Um, I hear them. Uh, like I said, uh, we will have an opportunity for public uh, uh, comment um, and to get more thoughts on it. Um, uh, I'm going to turn, unless somebody has uh, any additional comments on this, we're going to turn to assessment for a moment because one thing that was lost, I think, a little bit in the in the uh, three alternatives, and it, and it was very hard to narrow it down to the three alternatives that we did last meeting. But one of the things that was lost in it is um, what that assessment looked like, and I think Jeremy mentioned it, and someone else did. There was there there is a um, testing requirement in uh, in Toronto. Um, and that may be an option that some people feel more comfortable with is some kind of shorter test after a supervised practice. Um, and if that needs to be or should be reintroduced, um, we should talk about it. So um, let's let's turn, Audrey, if we can, to the assessment. Um, between the three choices, um, we talked, uh, there was really two choices under assessment. The first one was choice A that we talked about, and I want to get into the details of it, but a summative capstone portfolio at the conclusion was choice choice B, which was a, a more of the online modules, in-person workshops. Um, the one that, that, that was kind of left out in that group, um, and I think a little bit unfairly because it was um, put in with a number of other elements, and I would be willing to talk about and reintroduce if people had interest, was the additional assessment of an open book uh, or some other um, shortened assessment. And that, and that wasn't uh, on one of the su suggested um, choices that did not make it through. Um, and uh, I wanna bring that up now. So if uh, any comments on whether or not people feel more comfortable with the capstone portfolio, and then we can kind of dig into what that means or whether they like the online module and in-person simulated uh, workshops more. Uh, Mylin. When we when we talk about a capstone portfolio, does that mean that um, all of the uh, performance is all at once, or is this something that you're adding to as you go along through whatever the pathway is? So for can I, can I take the can I take the question mark off the end of that and say that that is your opinion? My opinion is that one should be able to demonstrate one's competencies as one goes along and sort of check boxes. And as long as one has checked all of the Kappa competencies or whatever we're going to define it as, um, that meets the final assessment, summative assessment. Uh, that, 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 that's a, uh, that's, um, I think one of the issues here is, you know, how, what is the process to go through that, whether or not that is a, and, and you've laid it out um, very nicely, whether or not that's a process that you can um, do individual capstones during the, during the process as you meet those requirements, or whether or not it, it is a final summative capstone that's all done at the same time. Um, anybody else have thoughts on that, Amy? I have that's similarly related. Has anybody talked to how the insurance industry is going to insure these practicing lawyers? Because if, if, if they're not able to be insured, are we, are we going down this road for not? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will answer that. Um, I think we are we are going down this road in an effort um, to come up with some other possibilities that we think can be validated. Um, part of that validation, um, in addition to some of the 
uh, issues that uh, Tracy and Dr. Henderson have brought up uh, would be specific to um, insurance analysis and otherwise. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not, um, I would be happy to add, uh, you know, uh, insurance, mandatory insurance uh, into a um, recommendation, but I, um, I'm pretty comfortable that the uh, Supreme Court would not be moving forward with something if it didn't have the ability. Emily. Uh, just so I, I think this is going back to Tracy's point about like maybe may having some broad recommendations, but not exactly putting all of the the dotted I's and cross T's and all of that. Because I, I guess with choice A and the capstone portfolio, I worry about somebody that's working, you know, in-house tech versus somebody that's working, you know, direct client services, family law, and like those two having to come up with a summative capstone portfolio that is scored by a regulator and presumably meeting the standard, that standard. Um, and I guess there's probably a way to do that, but it just seems like that's gonna be a, a really big difference in the work product, um, but hopefully, you know, gosh, not, not the skills they're getting. Um, and then I would say with choice B, Maybe, I, I guess I'm wondering, and I and I, forgive me because I don't remember this, but was Choice B sort of designed to get at that issue? Like, let's make sure that all of our people that are doing this pathway are having some continuity of instruction and, you know, it, like having those in-person workshops. Um, so I guess those are a couple of my thoughts and questions. And then I would say, um, you know, if there is sort of an open book assessment that we could create that is based on what we had hoped they would have gotten over the, you know, 1200 hours or whatever it is, then that seems to me to be um, inviting an, a question of, well, why don't they just take the bar exam? And at the same time, I still like the idea of having sort of that end, end type of assessment where they've really got to think on their feet and, and take what they've learned in those hours and apply it. So I know I'm all over the place, um, but I um, I would like to come up with if we if there is a way to talk about like broad strokes what assessment is best. I don't necessarily know that, but Tracy's now raised her hand. I've talked so much, so that would be great if somebody not me. <laughs> real real quickly, Tracy, sorry, but just with choice B. So the idea with choice B is it, it's very structured you're going through some of it with online modules, which can be really competency-based, right? You can go and, and redo some of those modules and then you do a certain amount of in-person uh, stimulated law firm in-person workshops. It's similar to what they called prep in um, four of the Canadian provinces. British Columbia has a different version of that. And then the law practice program in Ontario has like that structured training course for four months and then work placement for four months. So it's something um, a lot more structured with more goalposts um, than than um, maybe just the capstone. Sorry, go ahead, Tracy. That's okay. So I, I'm gonna just join in with Emily and, and again, reiterate how, how do we make this standardized and comparable to a summative exam that's going to be on the other pathway? I mean, um, look at all the work that's going to have to go into determining the capstone portfolio for that individual person and their non-exam pathway. The same thing with choice B. Choice B to me sounds like exams that you take in school. It's almost like we're modeling um, what you do in an academic program, um, not being a law school student myself. But um, the whole idea of licensure is you create, you, you go through your education, your training, your supervised experience, whatever your requirements are. And then at the end, you demonstrate entry level competence in one manner or another. And um, it's not intended to take a bunch of prep classes and pass those and check those off. That's what you're doing to get ready for the end all summative exam. Um, so again, I, this is where I'm struggling with the non-exam pathway. I love supervised experience. I think that's great. 
for our our boards that utilize that because they get that real world experience rather than just sitting in and listening to lectures or, or whatever it may be. Um, so again, that's I'm just I'm just struggling with some of this. My my point. Thank you. Tracy, before I move on, can I just ask you, is there a, um, uh, I understand the struggle uh, with the summative assessment portion, is there um, any kind of, because uh, I think I've heard you at other meetings talk about uh, the fact that you like the practicum and you like the, the um, kind of uh, uh, real world um, testing that would go on in it. Um, is there a process that we could create that would give you comfort around those? Um, well, you know, again, I like the supervised experience, having that a piece in there. Um, I think that... How does it culminate, that supervised practice? Because I think we all agree, or at least, you know, whether, yeah. whether you like this or not, that that's important. And then yeah. it's like, when you're done with that, how do we show that there's equality or some sort of equality in that supervised practice where there's a culmination and people feel like they learned what they needed to learn? Yeah, and, and that's the part I, I don't know other than an exam, because that's what our programs you know, do here at DCA. They, they have an exam, which is, is part of that exam pathway. I, I think that the, and I'm gonna go back to earlier comments, it, it would be nice to see the current exam restructured. Um, I, I think that there are opportunities to have an open book assessment part that, um, and then more of a, a scenario-based multiple choice, um, but really keeping it at a high level and so that individuals don't have to take a year to study. Um, but again, it, it, I don't know about spending the time to do the two full pathways because again, to, to capture that real world experience, um, to make it equivalent to an exam, a true exam pathway, it would have to be a very comprehensive exam, which may not reflect on the knowledge skills that those individuals took through supervised practice. So I'm not really answering your question. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how you would get there with that. It, it would be a different exam. Dr. Henderson, I don't know if you can, you can add to that um, because there's that knowledge content piece. You might be able to get some skills and abilities that you can test through that supervised experience, but it sounds like the focuses are so narrow. So then how do you make sure that the content is the same as that exam pathway? But isn't, but isn't that, um, uh, folks, I mean, we're coming to kind of the, the last days of us getting to recommendation before we send it back out. And so I'm um, uh, happy to share more of, you know, my thought process on this, wherever it takes us. I will tell you that um, I believe that, uh, there has to be change of some kind. Our, our percentage of passage rate is way too low. The number of people coming out of law school with large debt and, and are not joining the profession, we have a huge gap, a justice gap that needs to be filled. There are, all of these exist. I do appreciate that we are um, seeking changes in the exam, in the exam pathway. I do also wanna see um, the fruits of that labor. But at the same time, I don't want to lose time on some other options. Doesn't mean that we have to, that they're going to be the end result and we're going to take them. But for the court to convene this group, for this group now to spend a year on these issues and um, not come back with some kind of recommendation, even in a broad sense, that allows the court to continue to think about the issue, uh, that's a time that I, I would rather not waste. So um, I appreciate, Tracy, that, that that's a really hard question. I agree that it is. Um, and if there's a way we can get you there with some real specific language about reliability, um, and, and uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would ask that you think about it. I definitely will do. And if I may add real quick, I agree. Passage rates are too low and, and students and candidates are struggling. So I wholeheartedly support something to make some changes. So I want to be clear about that. 
it's gonna it's gonna be a a a, a test and it's gonna be slow and um, but I think it's uh, it's time to at least think about these things, Natalie. So I, as I'm sitting here and listening to everything, I, I think we're all struggling with what will this look like because it's something that we have not experienced, right? I'm looking at who's on here. Most of us, our lawyers, went through the California bar exam, an exam we all agree isn't working. So for us to continue to compare it to that really doesn't make sense. We, we don't want that anymore. We're, we're trying to propose something different. I, I don't think we have to go to the court with this is exactly what this non-exam pathway will look like. I think at that point, if we can get to, we want to explore this alternative, the court will bring on experts in that field that can design it so that it can be valid and reliable. I don't think any of us are proposing a non-exam pathway that wouldn't be that. We just don't have, or at least I should say, I don't have enough knowledge or experience to say, and these are the details that will ensure it is reliable and it is valid. But surely someone has that experience and could come up with that. That's just not for me or for this group, I think. And still we would be able to do our job as we were commissioned to do. Thank you, Natalie. Mylin? Well, I agree that we don't have to have all the details hammered out. I do feel that we need to, as we go through the process, think through some of these choices, these smaller choices, because we need to, there are people watching, there are people listening, and there are people who are resisting the concept because of what exact, what Priya said, that there's a, there's a lack of understanding. And so the more that we, consider and um, think of ways to make this a valid pathway, the better, the more we have um, stakeholder engagement, as she mentioned. Um, with that in mind, I want to just say one last thing about the um, as you go um, version that I articulated. Um, I feel that the least valid aspect of our current system and the most discriminatory aspect of our current bar exam is the fact that it is this high stakes, two day, all or nothing um, test that people are just, that, that has nothing to do, very little to do with the practice of law and that people are not passing because of imposter sy syndrome, because of anxiety, whatever it is. And so my um, support of the as you go is, um, is to address that, I am not saying we shouldn't have summative assessment. And just as a reminder, summative assessment is evaluation of knowledge and performance, right? It's, it's um, I'm saying that would happen as you go. To me, if I, so I teach a, a clinic that first semester two L's take, they learn how to do a client interview. If I give them a summative assessment of their ability to conduct an initial client interview and they pass that, I don't see why they need to redo that later as part of a you know, very high stakes um, performance, bundled performance. So I guess that's my last um, plea to, to consider that. Alex? Yeah, I got a question just for everyone to think about. How do we ensure that the portfolio consists of work done solely by the applicant? In the real world, especially in litigation, most, if not all, work products, whether you know trial briefs or motions, go through rounds and rounds of iterations involving contributions by either a supervising attorney in a solo shop or multiple lawyers at a firm. So what mechanisms do we have to ensure that no, no work submitted is done by someone else, which then sort of conflicts with the notion that all the work must, must be supervised by another attorney under this proposed structure or paradigm. I, I see a tension there. If you know, an applicant can submit work done by someone else, then what is the whole purpose of this condition? I thought, uh, Audrey, this has come up before. 
and we have addressed it. I just can't remember or how other jurisdictions address this. We, we, uh, we talked about, I think Alex, I think you might've brought it up in July before about um, how do we ensure that the work product is the applicant's work product? Actually, I think I brought it up, but anyway. Oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> but, but yeah, we didn't land on any um, particular safeguards for that from July. Does anybody want to um, uh, think about or address that? I mean, I think one thing we discussed was that um, the uh, work would be um, approved by um, supervisor at the time. And attested so, to by, yeah, attested. they have to the test and the supervisor would attest that it was their work product. Um, but the, but uh, I, Alex's point is one that uh, can't be ignored. It, it does leave some opportunity um, for, uh, for shared work <laughs> that we would have to, have to consider. I'm sorry, can, can Alex maybe clarify? I think I'm, I missed the point. So if we have supervisors that are attesting that the work that they are signing off is the, indeed that of the applicant, what, what's the concern that the supervisor wasn't actually supervising closely enough and it was someone else's or what? Alex, you wanna address that? Yeah, I mean, let's talk about real world um, practice, right? You have a brief, you have a motion, it goes through rounds and rounds of iterations by different attorneys. It's almost nearly impossible for a single work product to be done by the applicant himself or herself, right? The fact that the supervisor looks at it doesn't really do anything. I, I, would, I would think supervision requires right, learning and, and developing the, the applicant into understanding the law the facts and how to apply the law to the fact, right? That's sort of the, the part of this collaboration process. So my, my concern is it sounds good on paper that supervisor may be able to attest to that, but that's not really aligned with the real world practice. And I'm not entirely comfortable for anyone to be able to say, yes, this is the work product of an applicant, because again, and, and at least I'm talking about litigation only, I don't, really understand how, how that could even be possible, that you have a brief emotion done by an applicant and no one else. I mean, have everyone thought about that? Is that even theoretically possible? My you, you want to address that? Yeah, I guess I, I'm thinking my assumption has been that as part of this supervised practice experience, the individual would be given unique assignments. So related to kind of the experiential requirements. I'm just looking at Ontario's now uh, very thoroughly laid out that there would be assignments associated with these competencies and those would be the ones that would be attested to um, and they would be submitted as part of the capstone. So I think it would not be just treating the supervisee as if they were you know, just anyone else in the practice doing group work they would be getting independent assignments. Sorry, just to jump in here, with, with law, current law students that need a writing sample, they always do after their first year and the employers that employ them in their first summer know this. And so they work with the uh, student to make sure that they can do something during their summer that is their own work. Um, and yes, it's probably provide, there's some advice given from attorneys about, you know, just as we have for, for our educators, but I think that Leah's right, that you could have a situation where this is part of the portfolio. We know that this is going to have to be attested to by the supervisor. So this is going to be one you do on your own. Maybe it's the third motion for summary judgment that somebody has done and you know they've already had two practice ones and that's the one that gets submitted because it's their work but I see your point Alex I do because I worked in litigation for six years and yeah it's like round robin with those motions but you could carve out something specifically for the pathway I mean we also would have the option of uh if we so chose uh of having a you know capstone um that also uh, that included at least one in person so we could do a hybrid of, of kind of the two options that are out there. Um, so you would have a supervisor signing off on uh, the work as part of this capstone that it was done by the individual uh, and then some kind of uh, in-person uh, that could be, the, the, whether that's a, uh, 
uh, a, a, you know, a simulated um, event. Uh, Dr. Henderson. Thank you. I, I do want to underscore the importance of uh, having the uh, capstone work done by the applicant. I have had experience with um, orthodontics and the residency programs there leading to the board certification exam in orthodontics. Um, the, in the, the issues were that, uh, and maybe this is part and parcel of what it is to be an orthodontist as opposed to an attorney, but um, it takes a year or two years for uh, tooth straightening to uh, be completed from start to finish. And um, so residents in orthodontics do have their own patients, but they are supervised by faculty. The faculty do sometimes see the patient and treat the patient. So when cases were submitted for approval for the purpose of board certification, uh, it was a joke. Um, everybody knew that the work product that was being submitted was a group effort the American Board of Orthodontics instead opted to require a clinical examination instead uh, of submitted cases. Um, so I just uh, point that out as, as uh, a case in point where um, uh, the public's interests were definitely not served uh, by having uh, work products submitted at the end. It's not that it can't be worked out. I think some of the suggestions, Emily was pretty specific a minute ago about having the third instance of whatever the thing is be the responsibility of the individual. Without that, we can't say that the uh, capstone assessment is reliable. We're not gonna be able to say that it's a valid, uh, that the scores achieved on that are valid assessments of the proficiency of the individual. Uh, it would just be a total uh, exercise in futility as far as um, public uh, service goes on all of that. Um, I do think though that there's a solution um, to the matter of creating uh, the two pathways that can be thought of as equivalent. I'm going to just make this as a fairly high level suggestion a lot of details yet to be worked out on it but if there if if say at the end of the day there are two pathways one is a non-exam pathway um, and the other is an exam pathway that the same committee a supervisory committee with responsibility for monitoring and evaluating the work of two com two committees um, one focused on the, the bar exam and one focused on the non-exam pathway. That oversight committee ensures that the same content outline is built into both of the systems. And when it comes time to set a passing standard that the same panel reporting to this committee uh, evaluate the level of proficiency that would be required under both pathways. Um, there's a lot more that could be said that would be the responsibility of this committee. I don't want to dominate the discussion with that, but I think that um, some administrative procedures can be put in place that will go a long way toward ensuring the equivalence of the two programs if we can work out some of the details. And it's really, it's really hard to say that we can support or not support a non-exam pathway until we know what it looks like um, and what the uh, likely psychometric quality of both uh, will be. But I think we can put together some structure for the development of the non-exam pathway alongside the bar exam that will um, help to ensure um, at least the, a lot of the measurement issues are resolved. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Karen? Yes, I'll be brief. I largely, I, I 
the, the pr previous comments uh, resonate with me a lot. Um, I, and I just wanna underscore, particularly given the level of interest and um, sort of uh, thoughtful debate that we've been reading about, that we've been hearing about, that whatever direction we end up going, um, we are prepared to explain how a second pathway can sort of achieve the levels of a sort of excellence and sort of equivalent standards and the same level of integrity that the exam pathway does. Um, and, and we need to be able to e explain, I like the idea of maybe a committee that oversees both and can standardize, but, but, but there needs to be a level of transparency about how we're achieving those qualities because the public is, is not going to perceive this as a step forward unless we're, we're capable also of um, showing our work. And, and that maybe adds a level of difficulty to all of this, but I just, I, I don't wanna overlook that. I personally, I am, um, I think the furthest I could go right now is to continue to, to keep the conversation going um, that, that, you know, and recommend that we keep the option open I, I'm not yet comfortable for some of the reasons Alex says and, and others have raised that that this is that we can we can reach the equivalency and integrity standards both ways. But but I my mind remains open on that. I just haven't seen it candidly. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Uh, first, start off by saying that I agree with a great deal of what was just said about the issue of uh, creating a dual systems and proving to the public that we'd be able to implement them in a fashion that protects their interests by producing equivalent quality attorneys through both paths. Uh, there was, uh, as you mentioned, Joshua, a option at the last session that seemed to indicate a sort of hybrid approach. There was still some form of um, examination at the end of the path to licensure. But to my perception of the end of the last session, that seemed to be fairly roundly, roundly rejected. Uh, they, I forget the uh, um, number, or rather the letter designation of the path, but I think it had the lowest number of votes of any that were voted upon. I think I voted for it. I believe Amy Williams, Alex Chan did, and maybe one other. And that to me seemed to put a nail in the coffin of the possibility of, of a hybrid approach. And it seemed to be an indication that there was a, a divergence between the two paths that we're discussing. And there's really not much of a bridge there. If there was, I would be much more open to a non-exam pathway by implementing some sort of system that would bring in a degree of oversight through examination at the end of the process. I know that's an oxymoron, but that is what that path seemed to be to me. But without that there, I, I fear that there's an intractable issue of uh, the legitimacy and the validity of the testing system, or rather the lack of testing system that would, seems to be considered in the non-exam pathway. And the general consensus to those sorts of comments that have been brought up by other members of the commission previously has been that that level of specificity is not uh, within the ambit of what we are called to do. But I, at this point in time, just don't feel comfortable voting for a pathway that has visible uh, apparent um, intractable issues, such as the ones that Alex has brought up repeatedly, even as recently as this meeting, uh, without having at least a viable idea of how those could be addressed. And so at this point, I have um, tremendous concern about the ability to implement a non-exam pathway, that, or at least to make, to make a recommendation for the implementation thereof, uh, without some sort of addressing of those issues. And I recognize we are, you know, nearing the 11th hour of the commission, but without some sort of addressing of those issues, I have uh, sufficient concerns to not be ready to vote for a non-exam pathway to licensure. Thank you. Great, thanks Charles, appreciate it. Susan? I think it's important to distinguish the difference between a vote for the concept of a non-exam pathway and further consideration of it as an option and a vote for a particular pathway and or addressing all of the potential concerns. Everything that's been raised in all of the commission's meetings has raised lots of legitimate things that should be considered when crafting a pathway. But nothing's been presented to this commission that has suggested that a pathway can not be created. And I think it's important to recognize that the commission was charged with, with evaluating the exam and considering options.
And I think that I personally will view the commission as a failure if all we present is exam reform. That I think we have to be a leader in California. And I think that the leading means we recognize the concept of a non-exam pathway and that we appreciate that huge amounts of time for public comment and for resolution of all the legitimate concerns we've heard today will be part of that ultimate process. For example, as we heard today, concerns about insurance, very legitimate concerns, but California doesn't even require its attorneys to carry malpractice insurance. We merely require them to notify their clients when they don't have it. So I don't think we need to be too worried about that as something that would say the concept cannot be presented forward. The same thing with, of course, with any exam, any non-exam pathway, we want the work to be that of the applicant. But again, I think that that merely means we consider safeguards, that we invite public comment on what those safeguards might be. Nothing has suggested that a non-exam pathway would require that the presented work in a portfolio be the filed version of a document. And while many of us that worked in large firms have had the experience of a highly edited multi-attorney document, that is not the case for many of the PLL lawyers that we've heard from, from many of the PLL supervisors who have submitted letters to this commission in public comment and have suggested something quite different, that there is quite good supervision, that it is the applicant's work and that the applicant's own work is the final product. But even in the settings where it might not be, again, this seems to me something that becomes not an objection to the concept, but an objection to we need more public comment on the details and the formulation of the concept. I have been discouraged by the resistance to the non-exam path as how little of it has been fact-based. A lot of it has been to the concept itself and to imagined harms that we have not yet even gotten to all of those issues or all of the safeguards we might put in place. So I think it's important and I will be voting in favor of non-exam pathways because I think it's important that we allow development of the concept, that we not strangle this before we even get to the deeper look and to the ability to solve all the legitimate problems and concerns that we're all raising as we consider this option. Additional thoughts, comments? I mean, uh, um, folks, uh, Karen. I would just say that I think there's a lot and, and um, I think there's a lot that we can learn from the experiences of others who who pursued this sort of thing. I think that, you know, and from existing programs here and in other places and any any recommendation that we make in this direction should seek to, um, to, to learn from those experiences. I don't think we need to invent this from whole cloth. I also think that any recommendation that we would make to continue to study this account for the possibility that at the end of that process, it still would not be something we would approve. Like, I, I don't think we need to for, um, forecast the outcome if we, in a recommendation to, to advance this if, if we're gonna try to do something now. Emily. I just wondered some food for thought if, if our recommendation on this could have something, some, some alternatives um, like, you know, a uh, uh, non-exam pathway would be available to students who, or to um, applicants who have taken the bar once and not passed it. Right, so it's not an initial one, but you could do it after you've at least tried the bar exam once or twice. And I, I'm not advocating that, I'm just wondering if, if that's a recommendation. One recommend, part of a recommendation could be that we recommend that the non or that the exam pathway and the, the exam, new exam that we have um, asked or recommended to be created be sort of the first work done on this particular problem and that after 2026 when we have the next gen bar exam we hopefully have our california exam and i know it may not be then that's the point where we want to then start working on a non-exam pathway um, i'm just wondering if there are ways to frame the recommendation that is not putting these two 
pass necessarily on equal footing, assuming that the commission, I mean, if the commissioners vote and we wanna put it on equal footing, great, but would there be the opportunities to make some suggestions about sort of how this non-exam pathway could come about um, after the exam itself has really been thoroughly changed? Um, Emily, can you touch on that one more time? I mean, are, are, you, are you suggesting we put a timing mechanism in it, in the recommendation? I, I guess what I'm saying is that, and I, I should speak in for, for myself, I am open-minded still to the non-exam pathway, um, but it is not as important. To me, that's a nice to do, to, to change the bar exam is a have to do. And so when I look at what the recommendations or the the um, charges of uh, uh, for us, um, you know, the 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 basically we've been asked like, is the bar exam still the tool we should use? If it if it is, here's all the things that we want to know. If it isn't, give us some alternative tools and some specifications for those alternative tools. And to me, as I've said, the if the bar exam to me and changing the bar exam of how it exists now is the most important thing. And a non-exam pathway is a good thing to think about and to develop. And we've got a lot of information on, but it's not something that I think necessarily needs to be alongside our work on changing the bar exam. Then yes, I would say a recommendation could be that we start work on the non-exam pathway after we are much more confident and comfortable with what this new bar exam is going to look like. Okay, thank you. Amy? Like my colleagues at the CLA, I'm inclined to vote no for an alternative pathway to the bar exam, but not for the perceived imagined fears like Susan mentioned. It's because we know that public safety is the paramount focus on this. And you know, regarding the insurance question, Susan is correct. However, how is that protecting the public if the client has no recourse in filing a complaint and suing for, for damages. Secondly, I'd be more inclined to think about changing my vote if it was a small beta test group for those that have not passed the bar exam three times and have this small beta test go through a not, an alternative pathway measure their performance for three years and see if it works. Because right now we have the opposing views that Emily is suggesting. And I think we could meet for another year and probably still come to the same conclusion and the same um, voting metrics that are present today. So to compromise, perhaps a beta test with an alternative pathway is something that's warranted. So we have metrics, we can measure performance, we can see if it works. We know it works in other districts, but California is a whole nother animal. And that's my thought for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. So I keep focusing on the guiding principles that this group adopted back in October of 2021. Um, to shape anything that, that you might be exploring and any recommendations you might be making, um, which included um, exploring options to ensure that, that whatever, whatever you recommend would ensure minimum competence, would, um, would consider issues of fairness and equity, would consider issues of disparate performance, um, and and I, I think that the, the consideration of the non-exam pathway was a part of that, a part of the fairness and equity and the, and the options for, um, for um, reducing disparate performance that, um, that are found on a typical bar exam. Um, even if we make the best bar exam in the world, right, there are going to be um, there, there may be some, some issues with disparate performance, um, and there, there may be people who don't perform well on these kinds of tests. And so I think that was part of the rationale for considering 
whether a non-exam pathway would address some of these issues in, in a way that an exam pathway wouldn't. What I'm hearing is, um, is concern from some folks about the lack of a test, a lack of an exam, some sort of exam um, that you know we know is valid and reliable that we can really point to that says there's that that says yes, what this person learned through this supervised practice through the curriculum in law school. There's something that we can point to that says. This, this tells us they met minimum competence. So I was just thinking about what, what would that look like, right? And if we're talking about two pathways, it can't be the same exam that, that people are taking going through the exam pathway, right? It has to be something different. Um, one of the things that we had talked about that was included in one, of, one or more of the options that Audrey presented at the last meeting <clears throat> was having a performance test, a single performance test or two performance tests um, or, or something like that, some, whatever the structure of the future exam is going to look like, whether it's, it's, whether it has performance tests, it has some simulations, some, some piece of, right, some smaller piece of the bar exam that people who go through the exam pathway take, that there will be some, some component of that, um, that maybe we would, we would require at the end of a non-exam pathway, um, so we've got something to score. You can, you know, maybe you're using the same exact question that you're asking on the bar exam itself. So you can be scoring it again, you know, the, the same exact way you're scoring it for those people who took the exam pathway. But just something, it, it just felt like the, that that there was, that the concern about the non-exam pathway, that some people I was surmising might be more willing to think it a valid approach if there was some kind of assessment at the end. So I was just trying to walk through what that, that might be. And right, Josh, sort of getting back to your point and what Charles was saying, like, you know, do we put that assessment option back on at the end? Some, some kind of, of component of the bar exam that we create for the exam pathway would be at the end of the non-exam pathway. Tracy. So um, let's see. Um, I, I like the idea of putting a phased in approach um, that Emily mentioned earlier. I think, uh, again, I'm on the fence with the pathways, but I'm trying to be very open to the non-exam pathway and thinking again, if the exam pathway could be more fully developed and as that is being developed, there is um, the non-exam pathway that, that comes along afterwards or, or as it's being completed. And again, working with those uh, properties that need to carry over into the non-exam pathway. I also like what Donna said is some sort of assessment at the end. And I think the reason why people hang on to test, test, test is because we know that that is um, the best way to measure high stakes uh, professions, to do it in a practical, feasible manner. And I know it's not the most popular one and you guys get tired of me saying this, but um, it's really a good way to reduce the error. And while we love performance tests and things like that, it comes along a lot with a lot of error. You have a lot of rater error. Um, it's time consuming to score. And so that's why we always gravitate toward tests because we know that, that we can get a good, solid, reliable score with little error. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm open. I'm, I'm, I'm being open to these things, but I'm just, um, again, um, I think that focusing a recommendation, focusing on one and then maybe bringing the other one paralleling is, is a possibility. Um, that's my thought. Thank you. Additional thoughts. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Andrew. I, since I had put the options together for the last meeting, so we had, I, I put two performance tests in that option um, because we it came up in discussion. But I um, we heard from Ontario today about how they have those open book assessments that you can take anytime during the licensure process. And that's, you know, that's something that, you know, we could talk about, or we have talked about, I put on the assessment slide. It wasn't, um, 
what what we presented in July with the two performance tests could it could have just been subbed in for something some other kind of assessment, right? So um, I just wanted to put that out there that just because I had put it based on our discussions as two performance tests, not uh, necessarily what we have to land on. Jackie. You're muted. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> really appreciate the thoughtful conversation and everyone's input. Um, and I, I, the way that I think about the approach to doing something different um, is that it is uh, a design issue followed by uh, kind of an iterative process. So uh, in my mind, there's no way that we could come up with the final product here, but rather what we are providing is broad parameters for the next step in the process to work within, much like Kappa provided parameters for this commission to work within, um, and that there would be um, both a design element that would have very specific uh, design and reliability and valid validity factors built in, um, and that that would be the next step in the process. I would hate for California to lose the opportunity um, to move forward in this process. I think it quite honestly is probably going to become uh, a part of licensing and it already is for many, many disciplines. What we know about learning and how people learn and, and how people best establish competency isn't necessarily through a timed exam, even though I understand it's a practical and feasible way to do it. Um, learning uh, kind of research tells us something very different. So I don't want California to get behind the curve. Um, and I would also encourage us not so much to do perhaps a phased approach. Um, we know we're moving forward with the exam, but it will take a while to really develop this non-exam pathway if, if the commission votes to, to have it move forward, is to have that development start because it will have an iterative process. I think pilot testing or getting metrics and understanding it is part of that process. I think the implementation will take a while, but I'd hate to slow us down by saying first the exam and then the non-exam pathway, because I think the non-exam pathway is going to take some work and effort. We already do have a mini pilot test out there. We had both the 1390 um, exam uh, takers who then went and got licensed through this. I forget the exact number of those. And now we have the PLL. And I know that the State Bar staff is working on a study of those PLLs. So we're not going to be without data or evidence as we move forward in the design process. So I really do hope the commission um, will leave open the possibility for California to continue to explore a non-exam pathway, to design one, to pilot one, and hopefully to implement one. And I think it's just going to be a necessary part of licensing as we move forward. Thanks. Okay, folks. Um, Susan has her hand raised. Josh. Okay, let's take one more. <laughs> Susan. Sorry, Josh. Just to add one point to, I think Donna's comments were important to bring, it, bring us back to the guiding principles. And as much as exam and exam reform is an important way to meet the Supreme Court where they have asked us to be, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, we know exams do not do that. And even our reformed and better exams are not likely to make our bar mirror our population in this state in a way that's meaningful. So I hope that we will take that guiding principle of diversity, equity, inclusion, fairness, and that we will hold on to a non-exam concept as a way that can do that in, in parallel with a reformed exam and that we don't have to choose and we don't have to rule out options when we can have these phased processes. And that's what we've done in the past. And I believe it's what the Supreme Court will likely do going forward here too. 
All right, folks, um, this is what I'd like to do. We're going to take a break. Um, we're going to um, uh, let those who need to get something to eat here. Um, we're going to come back um, in 20 minutes, um, and we're going to um, hopefully have a, uh, a resolution to at least look at and kick around and think about. Um, and we can have an alternative resolution that says we're not moving forward with the non uh, with the non exam pathway um, if uh, if that's the direction that we uh, choose to go. Uh, but I do think I, I just will be maybe it's my optimism, but I feel like um, there's so th there's there's a misconception that what we're doing here is passing something that none of us have the skill set to do. I apologize for some of the academics. I don't have the skill set to do. But what we are trying to do, I believe, is come up with like some guidelines that we want people to look at and consider um, and think about uh, as we move forward with, with the California bar exam. So um, let's come back in what would be 124. Um, and I promise you, I'll have you out by two o'clock. Thanks, everyone. Let's talk in a little bit.
Devin, are you there? I am. Can we do this? Um, we're working on um, a couple alternative motions, including trying to incorporate everybody's comments. We need just a couple more minutes. Um, if we can just have five more and we'll start at 1.30, I think we'll okay. be much more productive and we won't waste people's time. And then okay. we'll have comments and questions on them and figure out if we have a path forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tyler, yeah. can you um, appreciate it? put up the slide for a return at 1.30?
All right, Devin, maybe one more minute, let a couple of people come back and let's go ahead and um, take roll once we have everybody back. Looks like we got uh, probably have a quorum at this point. Okay, um, let's start with uh, Joshua Petrula. Here. Susan Bakshian. Present. David Boyd. Here. Alex Chan. Present. Charles Dugan. Here. Jeremy Evans. Here. Jackie Gardina. Here. Um, Dr. Henderson. I'm here. Esther Lynn. Here. Tracy Montez. Here. Natalie Rodriguez. Here. Emily Civiletto. Here. Karen Silverman. Here. Mylan Spencer. Here. And Amy Williams. Present. We have a quorum. Great. So folks, um, what we attempted to do was to put together um, a resolution that we staff felt based on the comments that were made during the conversation would encompass um, what was the closest to consensus we could get to. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, if we're ready to, Audrey, is to share that resolution. Um, and then <clears throat> if we're comfortable with it, someone can make a motion. Uh, we can take comments on it and um, make any kind of changes that we see necessary and see if we can't get to consensus. If we're unable to, we can then go to an alternative motion, um, which I'm open to uh, anybody wanting to make, including uh, a motion for no uh, exam alternative, um, see if we can get a second on that and move forward. So Audrey, why don't we start with you? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen and um, thank you for bearing with us making this in real time. <laughs> um, okay, proposed motion, and it's, it's long capturing the conversation today. The Blue Ribbon Commission recommends the State Bar Board of Trustees in the California Supreme Court that California explore a non-exam pathway for licensure to practice law. It is recommended that this exploration of a non-exam pathway have a significantly increased focus on assessment of skills along with the application of knowledge and performance of associated skills for entry-level practice, de-emphasizing the need for memorization of doctrinal law. The precise elements of a non-exam pathway should be determined in consultation with experts, including psychometricians, to ensure the pathway represents a valid and reliable pathway to licensure. It is further recommended that the non-exam pathway shall include the following elements. Law school. Any applicant interested in availing themselves of a non-exam pathway would need to complete at least 60 units of experiential coursework in law school that covers CAPA skills and abilities. However, serious consideration should be given to increasing this experiential re edu education requirement. Supervised practice. There shall be a post-law school supervised practice requirement the exact numbers of hours required remains to be determined with the goal of consistency with the exam timeline to licensure. Mandatory and structured supervisor training to be developed by the regulator shall be required in order to provide consistency in the supervised practice component and ensure that the supervision continues to emphasize the skills and abilities necessary for minimum competence. A to be determined percentage of supervised practice hours may occur during third year of law school and equity disparity and cost issues must be taken into account. Assessment, summative assessment to be scored and graded by the regulator. Scoring and grading must be valid and reliable and may include a capstone portfolio. Capstone can be completed through simulated in-person assignments and or an exam component to be determined. Okay, <clears throat> uh, Aubrey, why don't you leave that up? First, let me ask um, if there are any comments or thoughts on the first reading of this, um, any suggested uh, uh, changes um, or if there's any kind of um, uh, agreement to where we are. Yes, uh, Dr. Henderson, please. Thank you very much. I just have one suggestion um, at this time, and that is at the end of the first paragraph, um, where it reads, the precise elements of a non-exam pathway should be determined in consultation with experts to, to uh, represent a valid and reliable pathway to licensure equivalent to uh, e equivalent to um, uh, an examination pathway. 
or with a standard equivalent to the examination pathway. That's my suggestion. Uh, thank you. Uh, Neil? I was just going to say, in terms of the first paragraph, you know, Kappa focused on KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. So I don't know if we want to rephrase it to say, with the application of the knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, for entry level practice or something like that. Karen? Wait, I'm sorry. And where would you want that? And I, I was on mute, Neil. In the so I, I think I think the reason we left out knowledge is um, is because we we expected that that would be um, through um, gained through law school. Um, because as we know, as some people have talked about, the um, the supervised practice program might not deal with administrative law or might not deal with you know one of the particular areas of knowledge. That that Kappa has recommended, and so um, the experiential pathway. I think the thinking was would be focused on the skills and abilities. Yeah, but the word knowledge is already there. I'm just saying the application of knowledge, skills, and abilities for entry level practice. And just just to line up with with with, with Kappa, right? Kappa speaks of KSAs. So then, Audrey, in the fourth line, I think maybe what's missing, actually, because it talks about assessment of skills, um, assessment of skills along with application of knowledge. I think, Neil, maybe what's missing is assessment of skills and abilities. Yeah. I mean, again, Kappa speaks of KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. So really one line up, Audrey, right after skills, add abilities. If, um if I'm understanding Neil's uh, point, I think he's what he's trying to do, Donna, is have it <clears throat> be as consistent with CAP as possible. So I think what, if I'm if I may, Neil, please correct me. He's asking for it to say assessment of knowledge, skills, and abilities, um, and then you can just take out along with the application of knowledge, and then just say and performance associated uh, for or just say for entry level practice. Yeah, that's it. Wait, take out which part? Sorry. So uh, <clears throat> after assessment, one line up in the fourth line, it should say assessment of knowledge, comma, skills and abilities. And I think it's I, I think it's just for entry level practice. Right. And keeping the rest. OK, Karen. Um, three questions for consideration one in addition to adding as dr henderson suggested the um reference to a standard equivalent do we want to say anything about integrity being equivalent I and mean, i think this gets to alex's point earlier that the, there's no there's no degradation of the integrity requirements um second do we want to commend the trustees and supreme court to consider standards for eligibility um, for the pathway, as well as time frames required to either begin or complete the pathway. And if we're, if we're identifying elements, do we want to identify those other two elements as well? I think those are <clears throat> both um, important questions. Um, I think it would be uh, uh, under time frames. Um, I do think that it would be useful to, even if it's in a broad sense, um, to make sure we uh, address it. We, we could add process there and then maybe put time frames and eligibility under process or something. I mean, if that helps simplify the list. I think the idea here is that, <clears throat> that, that um, those two issues would be identified through the exploration. Um, I'm gonna let Audrey or Devin, I think it's Audrey that's doing it, um, play with that for a minute and go to Emily. 
Uh, so one of my suggestions is to take out the phrase non-exam pathway and uh, exchange it for alternative pathway. And the reason is that we've talked about possibly doing a performance test or some sort of actual exam at the end. So I don't think it actually is a non-exam pathway or has the potential to maybe not be. I also think that that opens up a little bit um, if we are going to explore this. So on the on the first sentence, so yeah, a, a, an alternative pathway for licensure, it's recommended that this exploration of an alternative pathway have a significantly increased focus on et cetera, et cetera. The precise elements of this alternative pathway should be determined, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Eileen? I'd suggest that where it says it to be determined, uh, if you could scroll down a little bit, Audrey, um, to be determined percentage of supervised practice hours may occur during law school rather than third year of law school. Dr. Henderson. Thank you. Um, just uh, given uh, Emily's suggestion uh, at, in the first line, or well, the second line, uh, where it says an alternative pathway for licensure, alternative to what? So uh, maybe to explore um, uh, a pathway. I, I don't know how to, I don't know what words to put there, but to, uh, it begs the question, alternative to what? <clears throat> so, um, that, that sounds good to me. And then um, there's a place farther down uh, where alternative needs to substitute in for non-exam. Um, I saw it just a minute ago. Go. I might have gotten it. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're fast. Thank uh -huh. you. Alex? Yeah. So if the notion is that we're we're renaming from non-exam to alternative pathways because we are now contemplating an examination component, shouldn't we then specify what that component is? Without that component, I, I honestly believe we should go back to the original version, which is non-exam alternative. I mean, I think, scroll down to the assessment. Yeah, that's where I was going to go. Is the assessment? I mean, the, the, the issue there, and I think it was a it was, it was a fair question. We can try to be a little more um, detailed and specific about it. Uh, you, you know, what, what does non-exam mean? I mean, a, a, a graded and scored capstone or portfolio um, it, it, is that non-exam? I mean, that 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 is a, a different type of examination. Um, and we're talking about maybe an exam component we, we wanted to leave in because I know that some people would want um, the court to consider and to um, think about a um, shorter version after the, after the practice, uh, supervised practice. Got it. So in that sense, then, would it make sense to convert and or to and? Because now the examination, the exam component is an, op it's an option and, and not you know, as an alternative to the assignment. So, you know, you can either have one way, but not both. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following that. So uh, un, under assessment, capstone can, can be completed through simulated in-person assignments and or an exam component. If, if um, the group that was uh, of experts that was implementing believed that they could, through a capstone slash portfolio, uh, meet all of the other requirements without it, again, the word exam component is interesting, to your point. Um, because I think it's all an exam. Um, maybe we need to just be more specific on the word exam. I agree with that, but I, I certainly would not consider a capstone portfolio as an examination because there's not, nothing that is being tested, right? The applicant is only submitting their prior work for, 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 to the regulator for, for grading and scoring, but I, I just don't consider that as an exam. But anyway, I, yeah. I, I, think, I think the idea is there. 
I don't think it's just the capstone. It's also the very first bullet point under assessment, which is summative, summative assessment to be scored and graded by the regulator. Yeah. That in and of itself could be in an exam. It doesn't have to be the capstone. I'm not, if, if we're saying we don't want an exam, we want a true non-exam pathway, then we should recommend that. But I don't think we've heard that, so. Yeah, I think I think we were, I think we're looking for a, uh, I, um, I, Alex, I think we're, we're a little bit in semantics on this one. I mean, it, it, the third bullet point, the intent was actually, um, I believe addressing some of the, trying to address some of the concerns that you had, which is that, um, the capstone um, would be completed through simulated in-person assignments so that you would actually know that, that that was the individual doing at least a portion of it, right? They, they should, you, you should have that through the, the um, supervised practice and the, um, the supervisor um, attesting to it. But nevertheless, there was some, and I know some people still uh, like the idea of having some smaller um, written exam to, uh, at the end. And so I, I think that um, including that as a possibility that can be explored uh, makes sense. And so maybe there's a, a more descriptive language on the uh, exam comp and or an exam component um, because it does make it seem like everything else isn't an exam component. And I think that's not a true statement. Understood. Um, I, I, let, me, let me think about some language that maybe we can yeah. offer there. In, in the meantime, uh, Susan? I was just going to offer some language, Josh. Yeah. I think that what Please. might help is in the assessment component, we all of a sudden went to more specific language. Maybe we need to return to the language we started with, which is exploration of, and that we will, cons and that, you know, the assessment would consider these things. And instead of saying capstone can be completed, Maybe we need to say the capstone exploration can include or something, you know, just maybe we need more explore language, less can. I mean, it could say, uh, we could say may. What about this? Um, how, how about if we go, instead of using the word capstone in the third bullet point, what if we go back to just the assessment and say the assessment may include? And then we can, and, and then what if you, Ron, make we capstone is the same as uh, above. So what, what if we add simulated in-person assignment to the bullet point above it? May include, uh, you know, capstone portfolio, simulated in-person assignments. <clears throat> and then we need to do something with the the and or an exam component. What um, if you add the word written before exam? Does that help? Or proc? <laughs> I think, I, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I um, yeah, I think written uh, may work. Although a lot of it's written, so it's kind of, it's kind of a tough one. Do we need the TBD? I mean, isn't the whole idea that it's all to be, ter to be determined? Should it say summative assessment may include a capstone portfolio simulating in-person assignments and or a written exam component and then separate bullet scoring and graded must be valid and reliable and conducted by the regulator. He lost, he lost valid and reliable. Oh, where did I lose? <laughs> Great. Scoring and grading must be valid and reliable and, uh, uh, to, uh, and conducted or to be conducted by the regulator.
Okay. Can we um, can we go to the top for a moment and walk through this with folks and see? Do you want me to start reading it again? I'm, I'm assuming everyone. Okay. Yeah, let's let, let's read it one more time. Is there, Audrey, I'm sorry to do this. I know we're doing this on the fly, which is the only way we can do this, unfortunately. Um, is there a reason why exploration and explore one is underlined? I don't mind if they're both underlined. I think they're pretty pretty important to this group um, or neither, but one no and reason. not the other. Okay. Just to not lose the word, I think. Okay. Uh, okay. L let's let's read it from the top and, and see where folks are. The Blue Ribbon Commission recommends to the State Bar, Bar Board of Trustees in the California Supreme Court that California explore a bar exam alternative for licensure to practice law. It is recommended that this exploration of an alternative pathway have a significantly increased focus on assessment of knowledge, skills, and abilities for entry-level practice, de-emphasizing the need for memorization of doctrinal law. The precise elements of an alternative pathway sh should be determined in consultation with experts, including psychometricians, to ensure the pathway represents a valid and reliable pathway to licensure with a standard equivalent to the examination pathway. I, I would like to have fewer pathway in that sentence, but that's okay. It is recommended that the alternative pathway shall include the following elements. Law school. Any applicant interested in availing of themselves of the alternative pathway would need to complete at least six units of experiential coursework in law school that covers CAPA's skills and abilities. However, serious consideration should be given to increasing this experiential education requirement. Supervised practice. There shall be a post-law school supervised practice requirement. The exact number of hours required remains to be determined with the goal of consistency with the exam timeline to licensure. Mandatory and structured supervising supervisor training to be developed by the regulator shall be required in order to provide consistency in the supervised practice component and ensure that the supervision continues to emphasize the skills and abilities necessary for minimum competence. A to be determined percentage of supervised practice hours may occur during law, law school and equity disparity and cost issues must be taken into account. Assessment, summative assessment may include a capstone, portfolio, simulated in-person assignments and or a written exam component. Scoring and grading must be valid, reliable, and conducted by the regulator. And then I'm not sure if these are notes from um, Karen about the process to be determined, time frame to complete the pathway and eligibility for the pathway. Um, can we just look time frame and eligibility? I, 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 I do appreciate that we have a separate process. I, they may be able to be worked into the opening paragraph. That might be easier, just process and eligibility to be considered. Is there is there a, a let's see? Yeah, that that would work. Um, Emily, uh, I'm not exactly sure when we had the process to be determined, I was going to add something there, but I don't know where this can go. But I really liked Dr. Henderson's point about having this the a committee that would oversee both pathways committee so that those two committees are reporting and that there is some continuity and structure. So um, I maybe some maybe something about um, oversight of both pathways to licensure or all pathways to licensure would be overseen by, or would be handled by one, the same committee or the same group. I don't know how that works, so. I think it would be the committee of bar examiners if, if I'm correct, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Emily, I mean, I, I, unless you feel really strongly about it, I, I think Dr. Henderson was trying to accomplish that in principle with the language um, around standard equivalent to the examination pathway. Um, and so I'm hesitant to start adding in, I mean, if, if you really feel strongly, we can figure it out, uh, uh, process and um, oversee, overseeing bodies. I think that's something that the court's going to want to do on their own. Yeah, no, I think that's fine. The last sentence says to ensure the pathway represents, um, so ensure is in there. That's fine. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Mylin? Under supervised practice. After in the second bullet point, mandatory and structured supervisor training, I would add an oversight. Great, Donna. 
Um, <clears throat> going back up to the first paragraph, Audrey, where you added um, time frame, uh, including eligibility and time frame for completion. I think that's time frame for for development. Time frame for completion. Yes. Sounds different to me. Well. No, hold on a second. Let, let, let's, let's take a minute on that. I think the comment that was made earlier was eligibility for the program and then time frame for an applicant to complete the, the, the process, Don. I think that's what was intended by it. So it's not open-ended, you know, can they take 10 years? Is there a is there a start and a finish? I think that's what was intended. Gotcha. Yeah, I apologize. I I heard it related to a comment that was made earlier. That's where I was going. Yeah, so it's completion and not... Should I be more specific? Uh, that's how I that, that that's how I took it and thought that um, it was intended. Um, I think the comment was made by Emily. I think by Karen was it? Karen, maybe it was Karen. Karen. <laughs> All right. Well, if it's inconsistent, Karen, with what you what you intended, please let us know. Dr. Henderson. Thank you. Um, I agree that there are too many pathways in that last sentence of the first paragraph. If you say um, to ensure the pathway is valid and reliable. With a and with a standard equivalent to the bar exam. Nice. And I have a conflict. Uh, I'm going to have to beg off, but uh, if you if we're voting here, I, I support the uh, proposed motion. Oof, I'm not sure that that uh, that works on its own. L let me um, okay. let me ask if I have um, based on the language that's here, um, if I have a, a motion, we're ready to move uh, move forward with this. If people are comfortable, um, if we can get to a consensus and a majority. Uh, or there's other changes or we want an alternative motion. I make a motion, Josh, that we accept this proposed motion as written. Thank this you, Tracy. Tracy. I'll second. second. Jackie with the second. A roll call vote. Um, hey, Josh, Josh, can we have a discussion really yep, quick absolutely. before the vote? Absolutely. Um, uh, Devin, hold on one second. Uh, Jeremy, we can have a discussion. Um, and I'm sure if, uh, if you are interested that um, uh, we would uh, take friendly amendments also. Go ahead. Okay. No, thank you. So I was just going to say that I think the only way that I, I would possibly be able to willing to support this is uh, again to the points that was made earlier as to holding off on seeing, um, having some sort of timeline to this and seeing what would happen with the changes we're making to the existing bar exam. But other than that, um, I'll be voting against it. Thanks, Josh. Um, any other comments? I mean, it may, 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 the, probably makes the most sense, Devin. Let's let's take a roll call and see where we are. I mean, we can look at some alternatives. Um, I do understand Jeremy's concern. Um, I think that there is a, and I could be wrong, I feel like there may be a consensus to the, start the exploration uh, now. So at least we're in the midst of it. Uh, if that's not the consensus and we need to go to an alternative, we can look at that also. So let's go ahead and vote on the motion. Uh, Joshua Petula? Yes. Susan Bakshian? Yes. David Boyd? No. Alex Chan? No. Charles Dugan? No. Jeremy Evans? No. Jackie Gardina? Yes. Dr. Henderson? Did Dr. Henderson drop off? He said he was a yes on the proposed motion after he helped me with the language, but I don't know. I can't tell if he's still in the meeting. Okay. So yes. Esther Lynn? No. Tracy Montez? Yes. Natalie Rodriguez? Yes. Emily Civiletto? I'm here. Uh, <laughs> this is hard. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm a no. 
Karen Silverman. I'm with Emily. <laughs> um, and no, in this in this form. Mylon Spencer. Yes. Amy Williams. No, oh, not in favor. Confirming that was a no. Uh, the motion does not pass. Okay, floor is open for alternative motions. Um, happy to take uh, amendments to the current motion or an alternative motion um, that uh, anyone would like to bring. Josh, uh, Jeremy here. I'd like to uh, propose a motion to not explore non-exam pathway at this point, but that um, at some juncture down the road, once we've explored the changing to the bar exam, that we look at alternative pathways. I think, um, uh, yeah, go, uh, go ahead. Audrey, do we have a uh, alternative motion or would you like to write one? I had one in the item I can, okay. you wanna... let me just grab that, yeah. And then you, something like this, Jeremy, and then what it was the second part? Jeremy, you said um, exploration after the implementation of the. Yeah, I would say after the exploration, after the exploration of the or implementation really of the of the changing of the exam to seeing seeing sort of what happens with that. I don't know how to exactly word that, but that's that was sort of my process. Jeremy, if that's the um, uh, direction of the body, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can get that motion passed. Um, okay. I, would, I would ask if, it, uh, if we were unable to, whether or not we would consider a combination of the two motions uh, as we've done some work on what some of the potential elements could be at a time that the um, implementation, you know, post-implementation of the revised California bar. So let's see if we can get consensus on your motion. Um, let's read it one more time, please, Audrey. Blue Ribbon Commission recommends the State Bar Board of Trustees and the California Supreme Court that California does not accept, adopt a non-exam pathway for licensure to practice law. It is further recommended that a bar exam alternative be considered after the implementation of a revised California bar exam. Jeremy, is that consistent with uh, what you'd like in the motion? Yes. Is there a second? Yes. So moved. Charles, second. All right, Deb, uh, any comments? Susan? I'm troubled by voting not to even cons to consider or explore something that the commission was fundamentally charged to do. And I think it degrades what the commission was asked to consider. And I think it fails to take an opportunity for California to be a leader. Um, that said, I also think that at a minimum, we ought to hold off. I think there we don't need to decide today not to explore it, particularly where some of the new concerns that were raised today, for example, the concern that materials be from the applicant themselves. Oregon has actually just implemented a program where they have decided how to do that and have the application process apparently involving evaluation of the final draft by the applicant. Oregon has also recently started a supervised practice option for those who failed the February exam and has a 30 page set of rules that we have not even looked at or considered. So before we adopt something as severe as we can't even continue to think about it or explore it, I think we ought to at a minimum, at least hear from Oregon on these additional things that were new issues raised today that we have not heard what their solutions were. I have some thoughts, but I'll go to Emily first. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to vote no on this motion too, but I, I am with Jeremy on um, wanting, the reason I voted no on the last one is I just, I'm, I do not think that this is a recommendation as important as our bar exam recommendation, but I, I would be in favor of recommending that once the bar exam process is underway, then we move to 
exploring a bar exam alternative. Um, and so if that means that this is put off for the first year or something, I'm gonna have to put a timeline on it. But essentially, if the commission can recommend um, to the uh, Supreme Court that this comes second, um, and, and that's, that would be what I would support. So um, I'm just saying, if, if I, I kind of think Joshua was kind of your idea to combine motions and that's where I would be on this. Okay, well, I, I wanna just address Susan and, and your comment. I mean, uh, this motion is on the table, it's been seconded. We are gonna vote on it. I do agree, uh, Emily, with you. Um, uh, I also um, believe that there's a, a middle ground where we uh, have a chance to, um, see the fruits of the labor uh, on the exam pathway changes that that we've um, already recommended and will be recommending to the court, uh, and that um, there will be a time frame uh, not to lose the work that we've done and um, thought about around what a alternative could be. Uh, we'll see where it goes. Mylin, uh, I was going to say my understanding from the beginning has been that um, exploring a non-exam pathway did not prevent us from implementing changes to the California bar exam pathway. So uh, I'm surprised at, at um, this turn of events. Uh, and I guess I'm wondering if, well, if people, um, if the consensus or the majority view is that the changes to the bar exam need to be considered at the priority, whether there's still a possibility of exploring a pilot program, a, a limited non-exam pathway so that we're not waiting until after the implementation of the revised California bar exam, which could be years and years and years. I think we'd be really be losing the opportunity to be a leader in this field. Additional comments? Alex? Josh, this is Amy Williams. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. I support Mylan's viewpoint and I suggested a beta test program earlier today. Okay, we'll see where we go. We may come back there. Alex? <clears throat> Yeah, Chair. So here, the proposal is is that we we are going to recommend that a bar exam alternative be considered. And so, depending on the outcome of this vote, um, nothing would stop this commission from considering additional alternatives after this vote. Meaning, if I were to look at what the staff has recommended, I I, I do see three different additional options, and it feels like only one of them has been explored. And so, to the extent that we do vote on this motion, and that it passes then we can consider these options as alternative as meeting this very motion that we're talking about here. Does that make sense? Because again, I feel like we may have gone off tangent because the staff has three options in place and, and only it feels like only one of them has been in voted on. Um, I apologize, uh, Alex, you, you're gonna have to repeat that. I, it's a little faint and I'm not, I didn't follow exactly um, what, what the expectation is. Um, if, the, if this passes, you're saying that we still would have the ability to explore what? The options that are laid out in staff's recommendation, because this motion says that it is further recommended that the bar exam alternative be considered. And so, you know, and, and so if you look at the staff recommendation, there are three additional options that fall within this very sentence that we're that I'm reading, a bar exam alternative. And so those three options, as far as I know, we haven't voted on any of them. Or maybe the first one, uh, which yeah. you know, in a way is overlapping, and so that there, there's still two other options that are that are, that are on, on the plate. If we if we intend to put those options in, we would need to do that now through a friendly amendment. I I, I don't believe that the um, concept would be that we would be taking an additional vote. I think the idea here is we're going to put out for public comment, including by the way this recommendation. If this is the recommendation that that um, uh, we're able to get to consensus today on. Um, uh, I, I do I do understand the the and my interpretation of the paragraph the second paragraph here is that um, there's an the, there's an open mind to the future that that would not be this commission would not be uh, uh, the one to be dealing with that that's going to be dealt with in the future after the implementation however the court decides to implement it. Natalie. I second Susan's point. Um, in, in light of this new information that we have out of Oregon, I feel like part of today's discussion and the criticism or, um, yeah, a criticism around the non-exam uh, pathway was 
we didn't feel like we had enough details to come up with how would we know that this was valid and reliable, yet Oregon has been able to do that. Presumably they have experts who help them put together those rubrics. If not just listening to what they came up with, I would also love to hear from the person that helped them or people that helped them uh, put that together. And maybe that would answer some of the questions this group has around, can it be done? Um, so I, I would hate to say we're done exploring. when. I feel like that really was at the core of what we were asked to do as a commission. And we did hear from Debbie Merritt and Logan Cornett and um, Jeanette McKinley, and they, they are the ones helping Oregon with, with those proposals. Emily? So I'm wondering if Jeremy would <laughs> entertain a friend, Gen Jeremy and Charles would entertain a friendly amendment which would be the Blue Ribbon Commission recommends to the State Bar of Trustees and the California Supreme Court that California does not adopt a non-exam pathway for licensure to practice law without further study or beta testing, period. And then it is further recommended that a bar exam alternative be considered after the implementation of a revised California bar exam um, in consideration of that implementation, our recommendations are and then we would list those things that we have already listed out. Jeremy, that's a question for you. Yes, I think I would be able to support that. I just want to know what those additional recommendations would be. I'm sorry, guys, I, I had a hard stop at two, so I'm going to be on mute here for a sec. Yeah, I'll try to, I appreciate that, Jeremy. Uh, we'll, let's try to see if we can bring this uh, somewhat to a head, uh, but I, I do think it's an important topic and we're getting closer to, I think, what is um, uh, an agreeable solution. Um, oh, it Josh. sounds like, yep. Oh, so I would cut and paste the components from above, Emily. Yes, that these are still, uh, I think, good, very good and broad recommendations that if they are going to look at a non or an alternative pathway, that this is good information for the Supreme Court and trustees to have. I mean, we can look at the entire, we can, we can look at the entire motion. I mean, Jeremy said, yes, we'll need a, we'll need a second on it. Um, but let's, let's take a look at the entire motion and see whether or not this is closer to. I'm really, I'm really uncomfortable rushing this. We're, we're cutting and pasting and it's complex. Our, I, I know we're all trying to get done, but I'm just so, going to suggest that we might lose something in translation here. So for instance, there's important concepts in the preamble paragraph. Yeah, we're not, we're, we're, we're not gonna lose those, Karen. I'm in full okay. agreement. And I, my other comment is that, are we really saying that we're not gonna take this up until we've implemented the new exam or that we have made substantial progress towards it? I, I just, I, I look, we need to think through sort of precisely what we're recommending here, I think. I, I will just say I agree, but I think we are going to lose this completely if we do not have some compromising happening. And mm -hmm. if that's okay with folks, that's okay. But I just yeah, want to no, put that. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in agreement here. I think I think we, 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 we let me try to put this a little bit more back on track. Um, the, the, there were, I'm just going to give you guys my opinion here. The, there, there was a motion on the table. Um, there was a friendly amendment. Um, I, I believe that where we're, maybe there's a middle ground here that has a non-recommendation at the time frame. And Jeremy, this is really for you. I'm sorry that the hard stop, if you got just two more minutes, that, that there is a, a recommendation not to move forward at this time frame. However, after the implementation, if the Supreme Court wants uh, uh, to continue with a beta test and if the Supreme Court agrees then to then to explore the alternative and the alternative having all of the elements of the first motion. I think we had a lot of elements in that first motion that had as Karen pointed out some really um, important control language um, about validity and, and testing that that would be lost and can't be lost in a motion like this. So um, if 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 we put those two together, those two concepts together, uh, would that satisfy, uh, Jeremy, would you take that as a friendly amendment? So I think for me, Josh, I'm sorry for the background noise. Yeah, that's um, okay. I really 
I was I was really okay with with Emily's motion right up until the point where it said to list these additional recommendations. Um, because I think already by saying that we're going to explore an alternative pathway, we're doing that. But to add more to that, I just I would not I would not be able to support that additional uh, ask. Sorry. So I believe that the distinction, uh, Jeremy and Emily, we're dealing with here, and and uh, uh, is that Jeremy believes that you need to see the result of the exam before you um, spend time on the uh alternative Jer jeremy is that the distinction that you're making no i was talking about how so emily said it perfectly as to how i would support it but i think the additional ask of adding these um from that first motion adding anything from that first motion i would not be able to support if that makes sense um i, I believe emily was asking to, to to add the elements from the first motion are you saying you weren't even in support of that I would not be able to support that. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, friendly uh, amendment is uh, denied. Any other questions? I think he was okay with the further study and beta testing element, though. I, I think that's right. I think that's right. So let me let me. Let I, me I would just say though, I I sorry, I would withdraw that as a friendly amendment though, because it it that was part of what everything yep. I was providing. Yep. So let it let it live or die. <laughs> okay, with, with, withdrawn. Karen? You know, okay, Jackie? Um, it, are we gonna vote on this as it's written or are we gonna continue to? We're gonna vote on it as it's written. Okay. In, 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 unless, it, unless there's a friendly amendment and it's accepted with a second, um, then we would vote on that. But as of right now, I believe this is the direction we're headed. So I'll just say my comment. I, I will be voting no on this. I thought the compromise position that we took was to water down the original motion, uh, or at least what I was hoping would be the original motion, to just have it state exploration. Um, and that exploration would certainly include, um, and we can add the specific language that it include beta testing and study. If people feel more comfortable with that, I just assume that exploration would include those things, but we can certainly put that language in there. But the idea that we can't explore it until the new exam is written and implemented means that we're probably five to six years out. And that to me is, is a delay that's too long. Susan? A related comment, I'm troubled by considered after implementation. Um, if we are going to mean not until an exam is revised, tested, and given, we could be talking about a decade. Um, and implementation is incredibly ambiguous. I'm going to vote no. Uh, any other comments? If not, we're going to uh, we're going to move to a vote. Okay, let's go ahead and take a roll on this. Uh, actually, you know what, can we just read it one more time for everybody? I'm sorry. Audrey, can we just read through it one more time? Of course. The Blue Ribbon Commission recommends State Bar Board of Trustees and the California Supreme Court that California does not adopt a non-exam pathway for licensure to practice law. It is further recommended that a bar exam alternative be considered after the implementation of a revised California bar exam. All right, Devin, let's go ahead and take roll. Joshua Pertula? No. Susan Bakshian? No. David Boyd? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Charles Dugan? Yes. Jeremy Evans? Yes. Jackie Gardina? No. Esther Lynn? Yes. Tracy Montez? Tracy Montez? Sure, Tracy dropped off. Um, we'll circle back. Natalie Rodriguez? No. Emily Civiletto? No. Karen Silverman? No. 
Mylon Spencer? No. Amy Williams? Yes, in favor. Uh, Tracy Montez? And Tracy Montez, one more time. The motion does not pass. All right, folks. Um, uh, here we are with a potential alternative. Um, I think we talked about them. There's, there's a combination here. Um, and I ask, please, to just hang on with us for a couple more minutes. If, we, if this pushes, I think we, we, are, um, we will not hit our timelines. And I apologize that this is going longer. Um, we'll be uh, far from them. So, um, and the courts asked us to, to get recommendations to them in a certain amount of time. We already are going to be uh, past that. Um, with the extended uh, uh, public comment. So um, uh, can we, I'm open to ideas on an alternative if someone wants to um, uh, take a crack at it. Um, uh, Audrey, if you wanna pull up uh, the two motions again, um, I think there's probably a middle ground here. I would ask maybe um, one of the uh, members of this commission that has a, a strong feeling that believes that um, we were close with either one of the two um, and can make a recommendation uh, on a change that would sway them. I mean, I, I, uh, I think everyone was paying close enough to attention to know that both votes went by one person. I mean, so we're, 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 we're very close to understanding um, and having a, uh, some consensus. Susan? I agree, Josh. I very much want to see a consensus between the two proposals, but I have to say, as much as I recognize the importance of the commission staying on time, I'm, I'm deeply troubled by how few people remain in this meeting. I'm deeply troubled by rushing through, which is probably one of our most important decisions on the commission when we are already over the time limit and have lost many members. I would much prefer that we put the language out to all the commission members, including those who have left today and those who were not present today, and that we come up and start our next meeting with a compromise position that we can think through and have some time to draft proper language that cutting and pasting these two things together to get something done today, we are down to so few members of the commission, I'm deeply troubled we're not representative of the majority voice. Let me do two things uh, very quickly. I, I, I think the answer is yes, but Devin, can you just confirm for me we still have a quorum? Yes. Um, we have a quorum. So um, Susan, I hear you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. Um, the concern I have is um, it's not getting any easier. Um, and um, I think that uh, it's gonna be tough for us to get to, to, to the right consensus. We can start the next meeting. I think we are scheduled for meeting in three weeks from now. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate everybody's time. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Let me take a couple more comments and then we'll see where we're going. Amy? I agree completely with Susan. This is not something we should take in a rushed manner. I would like to see and have some time to reflect over the two motions. Perhaps after review over the next three weeks, I can come up with a compromised motion as many of my other colleagues on this commission. So I'm in favor of adjourning for today and starting fresh in the next meeting. This is Amy and I'm done speaking. Thank you, Amy. Um, okay. Um, I understand I, uh, and agree um, what we are going to do. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna be very candid. We are gonna to move to some kind of consensus the next meeting. We do not have uh, more time. We have spent well over a year um, hearing from folks, um, understanding uh, what the different possibilities are, um, trying to find some middle ground. So um, we'll convene for today. We have other business items we'll put on the next agenda, uh, out of state, foreign, that we still have to get through. Um, uh, Audrey, what is the date of the next meeting? Oh man, I should do that right off my head. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's, it's September, September 7th. September there we go. 7th. Yeah, September 7th. Okay, well, uh, uh, we will reconvene and pick up with exactly where we left off um, on September 7th, 10 a.m. Appreciate everybody's hard work. Uh, I will send proposed motion A and proposed motion B. 
that we had from today out. Thank you. That would be helpful. Uh, appreciate everyone's hard work, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Josh. Yep. Let's go ahead and continue. Thank you. Thank you.